Thank you, Wilfred. Welcome, everybody, to session two, Beyond Mars, Form, and Space. And uh, I will say some few words. Um, well, on this, on what we have talked yesterday, and, uh, and I will read, I'm sorry. From our explorations in the first session yesterday, it looks that architectural quality has many phases. It's far from a single definition and we'll need to admit there are many architectural qualities. Since quality is originally a neutral attribute, we can also get advantage of the idea of bad qualities. If we consider attributes plural and diverse, a same building can have good and bad qualities at the same time. Evaluating them separately would be greatly useful because it would allow for discrimination and thus allow suggestions in how to improve quality in a specific aspect. Anyway, qualities can be pretty subjective unless we analyze them on the proper context. Smoothness, uniformity, regularity has traditionally been associated with good quality. But for rusticity, the beton brew, for example, smoothness and uniformity doesn't work. In fact, they could be perceived as a failure. The very way in which bricks or the boards of a form were visibly and voluntarily placed allows the observer to perceive if there is an intention for smoothness or roughness, and then judge the result in the own terms posed by the author. A, pine, a, a point of view that could approximate us to a certain objectivity to deal with the relative and subtle line that separates good from bad quality. Anyhow, evaluating separately the different aspects of a same building has, to, to be, has proved to, to be a difficult task. That explains the frequency with which criticisms and teaching relies on an holistic, integral view of quality. A kind of absolute evaluation that leads to the canonization of masterpiece as has already been described by Horacio Torrent. Imitating those exemplary and usually exceptional buildings is then the remaining and uncertain path to achieve quality in ordinary buildings, as Carlos Eduardo noticed yesterday. Today's session is titled Beyond Mirror, Form and Space. The word mer seems provocative because we know that architecture is firstly and mainly form and space. Those attributes are the ones represented in the drawings that, that constitute the project. A document which is the very reason for the existence of architecture as a discipline. Anyway, I can identify two main aspects that can be considered beyond form and space. The first, materiality. The constructive resources that allow the building to exist in the real world. A matter of no easy or light resolution as Heidegger has famously suggested and of the highest importance to many of us. Once asked to define architecture, Mario Botta said, 
architecture is construction. The second aspect beyond form and space is behavior. What built architecture can produce on its humans inhabitants. Because behavior can only be induced by architecture and because socially established rights are less regular than in previous times, it is an outcome, outcome difficult to measure and even more difficult to evaluate. These aspects are part of the wider cultural meanings that buildings can convey. The following, the following presentations by Douglas Aguiar and by Vishnu Vasudevan and Hamasika Gama Daveli both concentrate on these elusive phenomenological aspects. But before that, Carlos Eduardo Comas will introduce William Curtis, which is our keynote speaker today. Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome William G.R. Curtis as the keynote speaker of this session. His subject, as announced by the title of uh, uh, his speech, is Architecture Under the Light of History, Examined Through the Lenses of the Unique and the Universal. This is an interesting alliteration opposing words seldom used together in architectural literature. <laughs> Unique, one of its kind, designates things without alike or equal. That is, uh, that is, uh, that are singular. Universal, from universe, all things turned into one, designates things relating, including, or affecting all the members of a class, in other words, things that are general. The concepts, not the words, the concepts behind these words have obviously something to do with architectural quality and are part of the discipline's critical vocabulary. Unique is connected with both uh, originality and uh, unparalleled excellence, the fresh and the unusual and the best in its class. Universal suggests commonality and consensus, something that is so good that it becomes a worldwide standard that everyone wants to reproduce, even if a building site is always unique. It might be that the love of uniqueness is a universal. The universal, the unique and universal is not an oxymoron. I look forward to hearing William develop his ideas. He really needs no presentation, but I would like to recall that he is the author of Modern Architecture Since 1900, a universally popular textbook released in the 80s, 1980s, and revised in the 1990s, a classic discussing the uniqueness of Western and Western-oriented architecture. William is also the author of at least two monographs on world-famous Le Corbusier, on his Will Oeuvre, Forms and Ideas, and a single building, the Carpet and Center, as well as a monograph on locally renowned Denis Lazo. One may not agree with uh, all his views, but he is amply qualified to talk about architectural quality. Without further ado, William, the floor is yours. Right, I, I, yeah. I can be heard. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Carlos Eduardo, for this uh, introduction and for summing up very well some of the uh, the issues uh, where is the uh, where the unique and the universal are are concerned. Um, I want in this um, session to. Um, be introducing the importance of a historical perspective uh, when judging quality in, in our time or even in any time. Um, and so for, for rather rarely, I normally don't read things out, but I wanted to be rather precise on this occasion. So I'm going to read 
Um, I've chosen two uh, introductory mottos to this. Uh, one is from uh, Goethe. Hello, uh, Joat, Johann uh, Wolfgang Goethe, who's, who said, uh, we have a blank screen here. I'm not sure what's happening. Uh, in, in art, the best is good enough. <laughs> And the other is from Schopenhauer, uh, treat a work of art like a prince, let it speak to you first. Um, I have a, a screen here with Prasit written on it, and uh, I don't know what else is going on, but uh, anyway. Um, uh, William, excuse me, you want to share your screen? Do you have uh, images prepared? No, no, um, it's just me. Ah, okay, fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> if you can stand it. I mean, I could point this at the river lot. No, uh, no, no, that's nice, fine. <laughs> there's just a nice Buddha you... statue here. Uh, just in case you wanted to share some images, that's all. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it would be too misleading in a way because, okay. uh, well, for any number of reasons. Okay, are we off? Right. <clears throat> so did, did that get across uh, what I just said? Because I get blanks coming and going. Very good. The word criticism comes from a Greek word signifying the separation of the good wheat from the bad. It is about identifying quality and rejecting the lack of it. In my opinion, there are no recipes for criticism. A critic has to have a good eye, informed judgment, a sense of social and ecological responsibility, a deep culture of architecture, and a long historical perspective on the vagaries of contemporary production. In reality, there are different modes of criticism. These extend all the way from the careful analysis and evaluation of individual buildings, which one regards positively, to the polemical attack against tendencies, which one finds counter to the development of an architecture of lasting value, even downright destructive. Then there are juries in which one judges projects on the basis of drawings, models, and images. There are even judgments of judgments, as when one questions the jury decisions of organizations such as the Aga Khan Award for Architecture or the Pritzker Prize, which uh, was what I was doing in a colorful manner yesterday. When I look back over the years of my own critical writings in journals as varied as the Architectural Review, Architecture Record, Perspecta, El Croquis, D'Architecture, MIMA, IARK, Architecture DK, A plus U Japan, A plus D India, and press publications such as El Pais, the Times Literary Supplement, the Indian Express, and Il Giornale de l'Architectura, I realized that I've covered a fairly wide spectrum. The question of quality in architecture is by no means straightforward. There are no accepted norms in the world of architecture today. But even for periods dominated by a particular style or ideology, it is necessary to distinguish works of depth from those which merely wear the acceptable period uniform. There is all the difference in the world between, say, Le Corbusier's Villa Savoie at Poissy, 1928 to 30, and the standard building of the so called international style. The former is a masterpiece which achieves a high order through a fusion of form and content and through its capacity to crystallize a vision of the world and a higher ideal. The latter may be an elegant composition with formulaic use of standard devices, such as strip windows, piloti, and reinforced cantilevers, but lacks this underlying force and vision and fails to achieve the same spatial presence and formal tension. One may evaluate and rank buildings of the past in a similar fashion, comparing individual examples of the same type such as ancient Greek temples or theaters, but on the basis of direct experience and careful analysis. Why is it that Epidauros consistently comes out topped in my evaluation of ancient Greek theaters? Why the Parthenon in the class of Greek temples, although the temple of Poseidon at Paestum comes in a very close second? Come to that, why is it that the Mayan complex at Ushmal takes on the character of a universal masterpiece an equivalent to the Acropolis in Athens, but for the Americas? What is it that creates the haunting spiritual aura of Machu Picchu, or that of Fatipur Sikri, or the Jain temple at Renekor in India? I do not have set answers to these questions, but I think that it is important to pose them and to maintain a long perspective when assessing quality in modern 
even quite recent architecture in diverse cultures of the world. One of my tasks as a historian has been to identify buildings of seminal importance and insert them into larger historical narratives. My book, Modern Architecture Since 1900, which was mentioned earlier in its several editions, first edition 82, second 87, a fully revised 1995, um, <clears throat> 96, excuse me, uh, later editions in Spanish, French, Italian, German, Brazilian, Portuguese, Chinese, etc., is in a sense also a work of critical judgment, since it includes and excludes examples according to criteria of long-term value. In nearly all cases, the published works have been experienced firsthand and analyzed in terms of their context and underlying intentions. I have no patience with historians and so-called critics who have recourse to empty slogans, uh, such as the new brutalism, postmodernism, critical regionalism, or any otherism come to that, and who rely only upon photographs and secondhand descriptions. Works of real interest transcend movements with qualities which are both unique and universal. Sometimes uh, I have discovered masterpieces by accident. A case of this was the church at Bausfeld, Denmark by Jørn Utzon, designed 68, completed around 1976. I was driving through the Western suburbs of Copenhagen in the summer of 1978, when I suddenly saw this apparition of a silver gray building with a step silhouette. I was glued to the spot and screeched to a halt. <laughs> On wandering inside, I was overwhelmed by the beauty of the interior flooded with light, reflected off the white curved interior ceiling, which rose and fell in a wave motion. This luminous space with its precise concrete frames and clean carpentry communicated immediately the feeling of a Protestant meeting house, a pure structure in concrete, metal, wood and glass. There were echoes of traditional Nordic churches, even of Japanese and Chinese wooden architecture in the profiles and underlying image. Above all, I was struck by the authenticity of this work, which was far superior to the trivia being pushed in the media at the time. But I did not know for sure who had designed the building. After a few minutes, I turned to my companion and said, well, this serpentine section reminds me of the section of Sydney Opera House. This must be by a high level follower of Woodson. On the way out, we saw an inscription indicating that the building was by Woodson himself. This was a case of a building speaking the language of architecture directly on its own terms, undistracted by questions of authorship. The first duty of the critic is to respond to the work itself prior to undertaking a deep reading of it, taking into account sight, use and social situation. Gradually, one constructs a narrative which comes to terms with the unique order of the individual work while also exploring the anatomy of intentions, the resolutions and irresolutions, the conflicts that is, of form and function and the situation in the broader culture of architecture. Bausfeld was exceptional on so many levels. It was far more convinc convincing in its fusion of past and present uh, <clears throat> than the superficial postmodernist and neo-modernist pastiches then current. When I wrote the first edition of Modern Architecture since 1900, uh, which was written in 1881, I did not hesitate to use Bowsford as a finale under the general heading of authenticity. I noticed that other critics eventually picked, upon the build, picked up on the building, but forced it into a priori categories such as critical regionalism, which were muddle-headed and which misportrayed Utzon's intentions and true historical situation. The uncategorizable work of Alvaro Caesar was likewise trapped in oversimplistic localist interpretations. It is always misleading when a theoretical or ideological agenda gets in the way of the honest and unbiased assessments of buildings. Several of my critical, <coughs> excuse me, um, I, I wanted to mention at this point that uh, the word authenticity was something which uh, uh, I, I was involved in, uh, certain concepts of authenticity in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and um, it, it uh, underlined several texts of the time 
um, <clears throat> which I published, for example, in Perspecta, Authenticity and the Abstracts, uh, Authenticity in the Ancient Sense, uh, Louis Kahn and Le Corbusier's Ideas of Parliament. And behind this was, in fact, years of reflection on the problem of symbolic form uh, in, in architecture and in the arts in general. Um, <clears throat> when I published Principle versus Pastiche, Perspectives on some recent classicisms uh, in the Architectural Review in 84, uh, which caused quite a stir. Uh, this was also coming from the point of view of the difference between uh, an authentic use of the past and a transformation into the terms of modernity uh, and a trivialization or a pastiche. Uh, this happened to appeal uh, to the CICA jury, particularly uh, <laughs> uh, Bruno Zevi, and uh, out of the blue came this uh, award uh, for this particular piece of writing. It was working with the difference between authentic synthesis and superficial pastiche. Several of my critical texts over the years have involved such close readings of individual works. I think back to December, 1984, uh, when I <coughs> critiqued James Sterling's Starts Gallery in Stuttgart in the Architectural Review under the, under the heading Virtuosity Around the Void, or to 1988 when I published The Anatomy of Intentions on De La Soto's remarkable Maravillas Gymnasium of 1961 in Architectura Viva. Throughout the 1990s, I charted a critical map of then recent architecture in such close analyses of seminal and emblematic buildings several in the Spanish journal El Croquis, such works as the Igualada Cemetery by Miraeus Pinos, the Museum of Roman Art in Merida by Rafael Moneo, the Congress Hall in Salamanca by Juan Navarro Baldeveg, the Miramaki Church in Helsinki by Juha Levisca, the Dominus Winery in California by Herzog and de Meuron, the St. Benedict Chapel in Switzerland by Zumto, the Sun Gat Studio in Ahmedabad by Balkrishna Doshi, the Palacio de Justicia Federal in Mexico City by Teodoro Gonzalez de Leon, the Presidential Guest House in Cartagena de Indias by Rogelio Salmona, uh, or the Water Temple at Honpukuji uh, <coughs> in Japan by Tadeo Andi. In each case, I combined direct experience with penetration to the underlying intentions and architectural ideas. In more recent years, there has been a string of texts on remarkable works by RCR around the Pijan Villalta, uh, <clears throat> such, as, uh, such as the subterranean vine winery at Belle York or the banqueting marquee at the restaurant Les Coles in Olot, Catalonia, certainly one of the most <clears throat> inventive and moving spaces of recent architecture. Or again, the Louvre at Lens by Sana, a work with architectural qualities and faults. Then there are the negative evaluations, the warnings and the attacks, the excesses of the star system and the pretentious theorizing that have provided numerous targets in recent times, all the way from the disastrous city of culture in Santiago de Compostela by Peter Eisenman with its dubious theoretical justifications to the poison mushrooms of Jürgen Meyer in Seville, which destroy and privatize an urban space. Uh, here, we have to salute Wilfred Wang was the one member of the jury uh, on, on that disastrous project in Compostela to register a veto and to argue it very succinctly, an argument that was somehow swept aside. Bravo, Wilfred, the voice of truth. <laughs> it's an absolute catastrophe. Uh, I wrote a piece about it called The Illusion of Plans uh, several years ago when I first saw this catastrophe uh, and then published you know, numerous let, uh, articles in you know, in, in Gallego, in Portuguese and so on, uh, attacking this monstrosity. I saw it again this summer, it's even worse than I remember. Over the years, I've published several articles in the outrage pages of the Architectural Review, uh, questioning so-called iconic interventions in cities, <coughs> such as the, uh, in cities such as the irresponsible proposal by Herzog and de Meuron, for the overbearing glass Tour Triangle on the southern perimeter of Paris. <clears throat> Yet one more hostile urban intrusion uh, promoted by means of deceptive computer images. There are also scandalous situations that need exposing, such as the fires which destroyed that universal masterpiece, the Glasgow School of Art by Charles Reddy Macintosh. Both of them probably avoidable. Sometimes it is a question of defending modern architectural patrimony. 
In 2012, I attacked the crude interventions by Renzo Piano, which undermined Le Corbusier's timeless chapel at Ronchon. In 2014, I was back in one of my spiritual homes, Ahmedabad, and realized that the modern architectural heritage of the city, including seminal works by Le Corbusier, Louis Kahn, Balkrishna Doshi, Anand Rajay, and Charles Correa, not particularly Western, I might say, um, Carlos Eduardo, <laughs> was under threat from crash capitalism and irresponsible real estate development. So I mounted a press campaign to insist upon the adjustment of Indian of Indian heritage laws to protect these masterpieces. Just over a year ago, the threat returned when the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad announced that it intended to demolish all of the dormitories designed by Louis Kahn. I launched a defense campaign in Indian and international newspapers and journals, which was soon accompanied by a worldwide petition. For the moment, at least, these masterpieces have been saved, but for how long? In these cases, I was arguing in favor of the protection of these outstanding sites by confirming their status as universal patrimony of humanity. One of the functions of critical journalism is to challenge the structures of power and to reveal scandalous operations behind the scenes. For architecture is not created by architects alone and architectural results should be in the public interest. Um, I've been involved in many such uh, <laughs> hit operations, not the least the critique of the Grand Projet in 1989, uh, Machine d'Etat, uh, uh, which was a sort of uh, taking a part of the uh, ideology of extreme technological centralization in France and the overall devaluation into neo-modernist uh, language in most of the Grand Projet. This brings us to broader issues concerning city, landscape and environment, especially in a period of renewed warfare and undeniable global warming. All around the world, urbanization is proceeding at a galloping pace. At the same time, real estate capitalism is making property unaffordable in major cities, except for the wealthy. The current plutocratic system with its huge disparities of income is leading to a total imbalance in the provision of places to live with the poor, even the middle classes, squeezed out to the perimeters. The rural base is abandoned as peasants flee the countryside and enter the money economy in cities on very disadvantaged terms. The glossy images of globalization, including twisting skyscrapers and flashy iconic monuments are distractions masking social inequality and the destruction of the public realm. These conditions seem to repeat themselves all around the globe and are accompanied by ecological destruction, which is aggravated by climate change. The destruction of biodiversity in natural environments contributes to the unfolding calamity. Needed desperately are new, even renewed models of urban and rural development that can promote a more equitable and civilized environment for all. Respect for nature is essential. Gaia, the spirit of nature, thus repeatedly abused and unbalanced, fights back against intrusive humanity, using the weapons of global warming, forest fires, melting glaciers, even pandemics. Whatever the mode of critical thinking and whatever the publication outlet, I attempt to balance up various factors which influence the form of buildings. The critic also has the duty to communicate ideas clearly in prose that captures the attention of, of the reader. This means that nine tenths of what is produced by academia fails to pass the test, being mired in obscurantism and the private codes of irrelevant cabals, uh, which is largely the situation in the elite schools in the United States, which uh, have a de developed their own kind of postmodern philosophical babble um, with brownie points attached, uh, with, uh, according to which flag you fly. Architecture is a complex phenomenon which touches people on many levels. Buildings may fuse together ideas and forms, images and materials, function and structure, social myths and poetic spaces. They occupy time in complex ways, crystallizing a present, transforming diverse pasts, anticipating unknown futures. 
Architecture is concerned with power, which is never a direct expression of an ideology. It is an idealization of social and political processes and of institutions. Architecture is rooted in society, but possesses a reality of its own. That said, the critic needs to be alert to the contradictions inherent in the architectural program and to ways that architecture can mask hidden political agendas. Good poetry communicates before it is understood. Maybe this maxim of T.S. Eliot can be transferred to say that, quote, good architecture communicates before it is understood. The poetic order of a work of high intensity pervades the whole at the level of space, light, geometry, material, and movement. The primary themes are reiterated at smaller scales. The meaning is embedded in the deep structures of the work and exists on several levels, some of them hidden. There is no substitute for this resonance, which takes on the character of a visual music touching all of the senses. Architecture has the power to alter perceptions of reality and to heighten the sense of the natural world. We are talking about masterpieces, of course, <laughs> buildings of a high order, but these are very much the business of the architectural critic, even if they are in a strict minority in any period, for they establish a level of aspiration which may never be reached. This is why a piercing critical culture must be nourished by a strong appreciation of remarkable buildings from both the recent and the distant past. Let Chartres, Ushmal, and the Parthenon be our witness. <laughs> Let Wright's Roby House, Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona Pavilion, Alto's Villa Maria, and Le Corbusier's Parliament in Chandigarh never be far from our minds. For me, the architectural, oh, and I must say on this uh, issue of the immediate impact of a, a work, only a few days ago, I was in, uh, in Navarre and went with students uh, to see for the first time the sanctuary at uh, Aranzazu uh, by um, <clears throat> uh, Science de Oisa. Um, I'd always seen pictures of it, was puzzled by it, stepped into the space and was immediately captivated. It just takes you over, the entire nervous system takes over. All questions of materiality become subservient to the underlying mood, uh, light. That's, that's an authentic work of architecture. This is the point, is this immediate communication, um, which is beyond words, of course. Uh, for me, the architectural work itself is the central subject of criticism, as against the theoretical rationalizations, which are so often deployed as promotional rhetoric by architects themselves or by their supporters. The critic needs to treat pre-rationalizations and post-rationalizations with the same sort of skepticism that a psychoanalyst would use to decipher the reasons, quote unquote, a patient gives for behavior. As a historian and critic, I'm interested in penetrating to the anatomy of intentions within a work, the structures of thought, and the ways in which the architect translates multiple realities through the language of architecture itself. What architects create is more important than what they say. And I insist upon the direct experience of buildings themselves. Works of real interest transcend movements and isms and, perceive, and possess a unique order of their own. The critic must remain open to fresh innovations while retaining a sense of history and what is fundamental in the art of architecture, a vision of what counts in the long term. I am interested in qualities which carry well beyond transient fashions. There is nothing more provincial than the present. Nothing can replace the first-hand assessment of buildings on their sites with people in them and around them, with unfolding vistas, with views in and out, with materials, textures, and details under changing light. No photo or drawing can supply the feeling of moving through spaces of varying intensity. Judging buildings on the basis of reproductions is extremely risky. There can be unpleasant surprises when one sees the real thing. 
one needs to be on the alert for collisions between form and function, between overall image and day-to-day -day use, between the aesthetic obsessions of the architect and common sense. The critic has to grasp the generating architectural ideas of a work, their internal hierarchy and the conflicts between them. There is no substitute for the deep reading of a building. There is an art to penetrating beneath the, soup, the surface to underlying structures of thought and revealing transformations of early examples from the history of architecture. It is especially important to do this at a time of spurious theorizing, uh, which asphyxiates architecture with clouds of jargon. It is crucial just now to debate the past, present and future of architecture. It, always, it is always good to be surprised by fresh ideas as long as they are substantial and not just marketing tricks in the media game of fashion and promotion. The critic needs to approach, approach recent work undogmatically to let the architecture speak for itself. There are no shortcuts and there is no single key to the architecture of the recent past. This has been a confused and pluralistic period covering a very wide range of production in an ever wider field of global practice. At one extreme are the much discussed iconic buildings, uh, often linked up with real estate capitalism, cultural marketing, the branding of cities in the networks of investment and tourism. At the other are works of such immense subtlety and topographical sensitivity that they almost disappear, although they touch all the senses and reveal something about the spirit and the history of places. You have only to stop for a moment to compare the Dubai phenomenon on the one side with understated topographical insertions, such as the sea organ in Zadar, Croatia, by, by Nikolai Basic, the water museum in Lanjaron, Spain, by Juan Domingo Santos, the Waden Sea Center in Denmark, <clears throat> by Dota Mandrup, or the photographer's house in the delta of the Ibero, Spain, by Carlos Ferreter, to sense this wide range, all, words, all works of about 10 years ago, or even more recent. These are relatively small but articulate works which respond to their diverse places and landscapes while extending earlier modern architecture and vernacular principles via an intense abstraction and materiality. In these circumstances, one cannot speak about a dominant tendency or about any obvious canon. The critic has to be on the alert for interesting or awful work in many shapes and sizes. As usual, quality transcends style. So does the lack of it. While the last few years have suffered from architectural excesses and from a thoughtless process of frantic urbanization, especially in China and the petroleum states, it has also been a period rich in new creative directions and will take some time to discern the overall shape. One has only to think of the vast range of production in the early 2000s to be struck by the diversity of approach, uh, all the way from the spatial gymnastics of the Guangzhou Opera House in China by Zaha Hadid to the restrained and understated Folkwang Museum in Frankfurt by Chipperfield, from the spatial inventiveness of the <coughs> Fundacio Iberi Camargo in Puerto Alegre by Avaro Cesar, to the elegance and tranquility of the new media lab at MIT by Fumihiko Maki, from the urban <coughs> presence and restrained monumentality of the School of Economics in Toulouse by the Grafton Architects, to the Carnian Echoes and local memories in the marvelous mosque in Dakar, Bangladesh by Marina Tabassum. From the tectonic textures and traditional Chinese echoes of the Ningbo Historic Museum by Wang Shu, to the hot, dry sustainability and shaded brick volumes of the secondary school in Kudugu, Burkina Faso by Francis Carey. This is to speak of only a relatively few works of recent interest. None of these are masterpieces as such, but each develops new expressive territories while extending strands of earlier modern architecture. The situation is like a delta with many streams or even like an archipelago. There are diverse cultures of architecture today, many of them still enriched by spatial concepts flowing from the modern architecture of the last century and even from the more distant past. The critic has the duty of approaching each work with an open mind but an acute sense of value. Unfortunately, much that passes for critical writing consists of lining up buildings and making them fit into pre-existing categories which are deemed either good or bad, a sort of virtue signaling. <laughs> 
We live in a period of pluralism, and this makes the task of the critic even more demanding, for he or she must discern quality without the props of a unified doctrine or style. A critical map of the recent past has to be developed, which avoids being either arbitrary or dogmatically exclusive. Of course, there are those who say that anything goes, that everything is about equal, and that we are floating on the surface with trend following trend in a series of isms like changes of clothes. Fashion and the flux of consumerism go hand in hand with a cynical denial of the possibility of depth. This is, of course, the sin of uh, much postmodern philosophy in schools of architecture. Depth is a dirty word, isn't it, <laughs> for them. In this scenario, there is no room for human considerations, for meaning, for social engagement, continuity, or principle, underlying the word principle. About the only thing that counts is access to the media and the ability to advertise different phenomena, whether museums, cities, or businesses. This position often hides behind the star system by reducing architecture to lists of famous names and prizes. It is the vanity fair of architecture. And of course, the Pritzker has been completely co-opted by international marketing capitalism uh, to you know, say, oh, this is by our Nobel Prize for Architecture, so you have to build it. You know, I mean, this is actually what has been going on, but anyway. On the other hand, there are those who pretend that there is an avant-garde in touch with a supposed zeitgeist, and that everything else is marginal. They promote parametricism as the true architecture of the times, as quote unquote, a new global style. The argument recalls the determinist propaganda of the modernists of the 20s who ignored the real variety of their time. Today, this approach smacks of empty rhetoric, especially in a period where there are so many different approaches flourishing. Moreover, does parametric refer to a method or style? If it is a method, there is no reason at all that the form should end up with complex geometry. If it is a style, uh, there are many ways of achieving complex geometry without any single method. The links in this ideological fiction are rather loose. Anyway, the real question for the critic is this, do the results succeed as architecture? One has to keep coming back to buildings themselves in real space, not just to seductive virtual images. There is a weird scientism today that peddles the fiction that machines can somehow generate forms. Mathematical tricks on the computer screen are no substitute for substantial architectural thinking, a rigorous architectural language, and a deep culture of architecture to back them up. Architectural judgments must be made on the basis of architectural results, not deflected by passing intellectual fads or transient images. Architecture speaks its own language, and that is what we have to react to. It is not the function of criticism to try to ram individual buildings into simplistic categories where parametricism is concerned, the needs to discriminate between mediocre and quality results. The, putting it simply, there are complex curves, folds, and irregular geometries which mean something, which add to the stock of authentic architectural inventions. And there are others, too many in fact, that are meaningless and arbitrary, that are ugly to look at, hell to live in, and destructive of their setting, whether in landscape or city. Many of the buildings that fly the flag of geometrical complexity, quote unquote, are in fact rather simple minded and have no staying power. On the other hand, a knee jerk acceptance of simplicity and restraint as antidotes can be equally misleading, especially when defended with a messy mixture of moralism and phenomenological jargon about place, landscape, regrounding and tactile experience, and tralali and tralala. Minimally correct architecture can camouflage a host of architectural sins and often lapses into merely pleasing shape making without underlying content. Once the smoke screens of innovation blow away, one is left with some uncomfortable comparisons. Is there anyone around today who can equal the sculptural power and symbolic resonance of the shells of the Sydney Opera House, or who can match the haunting presence multiple meanings, spatial and geometrical sophistication of the curved side chapels in Le Corbusier's Monastery of La Tourette, or who can produce the equivalent for the topographical richness and layered associations of Alto's curves in the Villa Maria. In these cases, the curves are embedded in the deep order of the building itself and in the mythical structures of the architect's creative universe. There is a huge difference between an abstraction which distills experience and content 
and one which ends up with mere shape-making for the sake of shape-making. The latter results in empty gestures, a vapid formalism. Then there is what might be called the theoretical fallacy, the naive belief that buildings can be evaluated by their supposed adherence to intellectualized nonsense referred to charitably as philosophy. In this scenario, technological mystification is often combined with smoke screens of theoretical jargon. There is no single dominant trend in recent architecture, but there are some shared territories of investigation. There are problems that are in the air, partly because of society and the condition of the world uh, that require, requiring that they be solved, partly because the discipline of architecture itself is searching for generic solutions. Take, for example, <clears throat> the question of the natural and its relation to the artificial. This has led to a rich range of works in recent years, embracing both architecture and the larger scale of land landscape architecture. Uh, the work of RCR, Aranda Pijen Vilalta, is deeply involved with the definition of a new middle landscape between an abandoned agriculture, the new commercial spaces and rural nature. There is an engagement with local landscape and with a Catalan tradition, but the means used are universal. RCR could not be where they are without both Anders Water Temple of the early 1990s and the Zen Gardens of Kyoto, not to mention Mies van der Rohe and Richard Serra. They rely upon a, a resonant abstraction and an intense materiality in their work. Nature, quote unquote, <clears throat> of course has different meanings and interpretations in different cultures. And the recent work of Japanese architects such as Yunio Ishigami which juxtaposes delicate steel frames with stems and fronds of vegetation, draws upon a long indigenous landscape tradition for intensifying the experience of the natural world by means of abstract geometries and framed views. In tropical zones of Latin America, recurrent vernacular devices, such as sheltering parasols and cross-ventilated spaces protected from direct sunlight by lattices or screens, take on diverse forms via a modernist concern for abstraction and transparency. All around the world, new paradigms are emerging, dealing with a host of issues, from the redefinition of the skyscraper, to the reformulation of cultural identities, to the reconceptualization of the landscape, to the exploration of new conceptions of space. There is more continuity than is often admitted, and in contemporary architecture, there are many fusions of the local and the general, just as there have been from the earliest days of the modern movement. There's nothing new about that. There are constant cross-pollinizations from one place to another. Take recent architecture in India or Mexico, which continues to excavate rich national heritages in search of fundamentals while fusing lessons drawn from cosmopolitan influences. Or take the case of Finland. A younger generation is emerging that is open to recent developments internationally but attempts to maintain a critical distance from fast track globalized image production. There are substructures to do with landscape, light, materiality, fragmentation, the abstraction of nature, etc., which are inherited almost unconsciously from earlier generations going back to Alto and even beyond. Does this mean that there is a specifically Finnish modern architecture? I do not think so, but there may be a specifically Finnish way of occupying the space of international modern architecture. Years ago, the Mexican painter Rufino Tamayo suggested that art is universal, the accent is local. Generalizations about the state of architecture in the diverse countries and regions and subcultures of Latin America are of course risky and a sophisticated critical map is needed to chart recent developments. But there are recurrent obsessions which take diverse forms. Amongst, among these is the desire to respond to variable landscape and climatic conditions through natural means and devices abstracted from the wisdom of the local vernaculars, but without relapsing into folklorist imagery. It, without relapsing into folklorist imagery. Depending upon the country, region, or even locality, there is a recall of tradition, but at the level of substructures and basic types, uh, rather than obvious references. Recent industrial and cybernetic techniques may be mixed with handicraft methods, employing timber or rammed earth in works which exploit such polarities to great effect. There may be a direct reliance on perennial devices for handling light, shade, wind, 
and Rain, while still extending expanding dynamic spatial concepts from earlier modern architecture. In most Latin American societies, there are buried histories under the layers of colonial, uh, colonialism and modernization. The contemporary architect works against the backdrop of the vast and sublime nature and a lost sacred landscape. And nature <clears throat> that means profit for global capitalism, but basic sustenance, cultural identity, and memory for threatened indigenous peoples. Long established and underlying themes, such as the need to balance the local and the general, the regional and the universal, the natural and the artificial, which stretch back to the pioneering works by the likes of Oscar Niemeyer, Carlos Raul Villanueva, Enrique del Moral, and Luis Paragan in one generation, Villanova Artigas, Rogelio Samona, Paulo <clears throat> Mendes de Rocha, and Teodoro Gonzalez de Leon in a later one, continue to resurface in new forms. In fact, they supply the gold standards. We were talking about the problem of the canonical. We could go into great detail as to why, say, the house in Canoas uh, is uh, such a totally important canonical work uh, in Latin American architecture, but in all architecture. Or since I mentioned it yesterday, Salmona's absolute masterpiece uh, of the official guest house. Uh, you know, these are works so dense in, in meaning and compression and so forth. So another two minutes or so. Um, <clears throat> there are continuing lines of investigation embodying <clears throat> embedded types and deep mental structures which continue like rhizomes beneath the surface, suddenly re-emerging in the light of contemporary experimentation with vital new inventions. Many years ago in the architectural journal MIMA in early 1986, I sketched out a model for dealing with the fusion of modernism and the cultural excavations, excavations of diverse local pasts in a text entitled Towards an Authentic Regionalism. The best recent work continues to maintain a tense equilibrium between imported concepts and indigenous ones, between the diverse trends of modernism and new visions for rapidly changing and urbanizing societies. The deepest creations seem to touch upon the hidden layers of fundamentals in the past. Hence the proposed title of the keynote lecture I'm going to give in the Biennale of Architecture in a month's time, The View from Machu Picchu, The Geology of History and the Strata of Time. When one takes a transcontinental view of Latin America over the last 15 years, years or so, one is struck by the richness, inventiveness, and range of architectural invention, as well as the diversity of architectural cultures, each with their internal lines of continuity. All the way from the haunting tropical wooden lattice parasols and organic cellular polygons of the orchid diorama in the botanical garden at Medellin by Plen B Architects, to the abstract sobriety and geometry of the Paracas Museum in the Peruvian desert by Sarah Barclay and Jean-Pierre Cruz. All the way from the monumental metropolitan presence and suspended interior social landscape of steel bookshops, uh, uh, bookstacks in the Vasconcelos Library in Mexico City by Alberto Calash, to the grid of eucalyptus poles and shaded timber overhangs of the children's village in the rustic setting of the Brazilian forest 2017 by LF Zero and Rosenbaum. All the way from the restrained elegance, tectonic precision and transparency of villas by, by Matthias Klotz and Smaja Nordic in the vast rocky landscape on the Pacific Rim of Chile to the dramatic spatial transitions and floating plains of the Adolf Ibanez University in Santiago uh, <clears throat> by Jose Cruz Ovalle. Meanwhile, in a multidisciplinary practice like that of Alejandro Aravena Elemental, uh, there is grappling with a wide range of tasks from the institutional and monumental to low cost housing for the largest number. So the list could go on, uh, investigating in each case the position of each project or architect in the larger sphere of things. Nor should this reflection be allowed to slip into a merely marginal or peripheral discourse. The best recent work contributes to an, an, an emerging global culture of architecture, even as it extends local agendas. <clears throat> Old contrast between center and boundaries no longer makes sense. Hence, even works of relative modesty, such as the domestic <coughs> collection of cubes and patios, of the Brumas House of 2017, designed by Fernando Canales, 
for woodland site deep in the Mexican countryside, draw upon and contribute to a cosmopolitan architectural culture. Their echoes in this project of local peasant vernaculars and of the fragmented plan of Utzon's Canlis in Mallorca 40 years earlier. Architecture of real interest draws upon many sources and memories, then transforms them to fit a new myth, a new set of architectural ideas. The San Bernardo Chapel, San Bernardo Chapel near Cordova in Argentina of 2015 by Nicolas Campadonico establishes a spiritual precinct by means of textured walls and a curved vaulted space constructed entirely from bricks recycled from a pre-existing rural house. The interior draws in daylight from the west, casts the shadow of a cross and establishes a numinous presence by abstracting nature in a manner reminiscent of the cosmic planetary spaces of the light artist James Terrell, such as his Roden Crater in Northern Arizona. Yet this work also extends a tradition in brick and ceramic tradition uh, ideas running back to the curved structural membranes uh, uh, of the Uruguayan architect and engineer Eladio Dieste. The highly original triangular Torre Reforma in Mexico City, 2017 by LBR and A Architects breaks new ground in redefining the structural, environmental and social definition of the skyscraper as a type in a global context, but yet does so in a manner attuned to its urban surroundings at several scales. We live in a world where seminal ideas cross and recross frontiers, cross breeding in unexpected hybrid combinations, back and forth between Europe, Japan, India, China, USA, even Bangladesh, and to and fro between different poles in Latin America and the wider world. To conclude, one's works of architecture do not reduce themselves to positions or to theoretical slogans. They are not there to fulfill academic agendas. Buildings speak to us directly through space, form, material, image, detail, and they touch us on many levels, mentally and physically. Many works that are proposed as radical innovations fade away because they are transient without formal presence or underlying content. One must maintain the long historical view, needed as an undogmatic, undogmatic approach, which is open to the fresh invention, to buildings which add something substantial to the place where they are built and which reveal new dimensions of social reality while also contributing to the general culture of architecture. Outstanding buildings have a way of combining the unique with something more universal, but one should never forget the, the architectural ideas, that architectural ideas are of a special nature, different, for example, from theoretical ideas or literary ideas or mathematical ideas. The ultimate test is the finished work, whatever the process which led to it. Works of any depth fit into time in complex ways and on different wavelengths. The first is that of the contemporary. The building address, addresses the issues of its time. The second wavelength is longer. It is the level of the middle distant past, which is liable to include the inheritance of some strand or another of modern architecture. The work reflects unconsciously spatial structures and architectural concepts, but the architect also makes his or her reading of key works of the modern tradition, which is anything but monolithic. The third level is very long and slow, is the slong wave, slong, long wave motion of history of forms. Many even engage with issues uh, running back to the basis of architecture itself. It is the level of the long durée, which can take us back over centuries and engage with certain archetypal situations. At this, at this level, there may even be an engagement with constructs of nature nature in quotation marks. It is not just a matter of sticking green salad on, on all over facades to show that one is being ecologically responsible. It is a matter of understanding the types and variations of natural design and their reasons for being. As Goethe implied and both Wright and Alto asserted each in his own way, art may aspire to the qualities of natural creation, not through imitation, but through abstraction and transformation. Whatever the obsessions of the architect, they have ultimately to be translated into the architectural language, into an architectural language, 
which can then be used to create individual works. At this point, a whole new set of conditions apply. We are in the realm of architectural ideas, not just ideas about or around architecture. There is an absurd neo-avant-gardism in so many universities today that sets up a false opposition between contemporary architecture and tradition, whereas, whereas in fact, all architecture evolves from earlier architecture on some level, even when in opposition to what has come before. When wearing the hat of the critic, I do not abandon the hat of the historian. And here the same rigor has to apply in judging the works of our time against the great works of the past. The best of modern architecture incorporates ancient wisdom in new forms and spatial concepts adjusted to contemporary reality and technology. The word radical comes to mind as it implies being revolutionary and returning to roots. I've always rather liked a, an observation of the Finnish architect, Olis Blomsted. If you wish to create something new, study that which is ancient. Thank you, William. Um, so we have uh, left, uh, some time left for questions and uh, we are open to them. Uh, if you would like to ask questions, please use the um, the, re the reactions um, uh, button by raising your hand. Carlos. Your, your micro, open your micro. Thank you, William, for uh, such a rich uh, reading of, uh, let's say, the architectural scene of the last century. Um, I do have a question, is, uh, or I, I would like you to comment. Uh, Fernando, in his introduction, uh, spoke about buildings having bad and uh, good qualities, but quality may be understood uh, uh, as, as a neutral term. And uh, how would your reaction be uh, to the fact that uh, masterpieces throughout it, their story, history, also manifest flaws. And uh, I, I mean, uh, the example that comes to mind is really Villa Savoie. No, of course. <laughs> impossible to live in. So yes. how, would you, how would you evaluate, you know, the bad thing with the good? Well, I mean, even before you mentioned the Villa Savoie, I was thinking of the Villa Savoie and even in, in, in thought of inserting it in my, my discourse. Um, yes, I mean, look at the situation. Here we have um, a work which is conceptually, formally, and in any number of other ways, absolutely remarkable, that was somewhat unlivable, that was rarely lived in, that was very nearly destroyed, uh, that was turned into a ruin and then was restored uh, and then goes on being in some way uh, an, an exemplar. Um, I would just say that, that represents the ambiguity of existence. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I don't think one can draw a, a large scale conclusion of any kind from that. I mean, this is, uh, uh, one should mention all of the above uh, concerning this object. What do you think, Carlos? Sengul has a question and Silvia Arango has a question. Yes. Okay. Senghur. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Please Hello, switch Senghur. on your camera. We'd love to see you. <laughs> ah, you miss me. Okay, call me later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think uh, it was a very good presentation and I totally concur with you and, and I'm fond of reading you. However, there is a point I'd like to discuss further, not to discuss, but um, uh, wish to hear your uh, opinion on it. Um, you said good architecture communicates before it is evaluated. 
which is also correct. However, uh, as academicians, we need some terms on which uh, we can communicate with the public, with the reader. Therefore, academic critics uh, also try to build a terminology. Uh, yes. But you, you said, uh, phenomenological jargon. If we don't study on it, how can we communicate with the public that uh, this or that architecture is really uh, piercing my heart? You know, then we all turn into Adelous Huxtable. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, and but we want to make better, uh, William. <laughs> but, so so I'm it, studying on it, actually, uh, because yes. we have to build a terminology. You are right. Again, I concur with you on the point. But uh, we have uh, uh, to further, um, the, we have to make progress uh, in terms of communication with the public. So we have uh, to define uh, certain words uh, or um, terminology uh, related to feelings uh, towards buildings. That's why I don't consider phenomenology as jargon. Sorry. <laughs> well, um, you know, the, the uh, observation that good buildings communicate before they're understood is in the, the realm of the ineffable and the immediate. Uh, it's to do with buildings touching us. That's uh, only step one. Uh, the question is, do you want to then go on or do I want to go on and try and work out what it is that's happening, why this is touching me, uh, yes. analyzing it, which I did for three and a half hours with the students in this church uh, four days ago, of course. But um, at this point, this raises the question of texts. And I would make a distinction between high quality analytical and poetic texts and texts which are loaded with jargon. Um, I have read Merleau-Ponty, I have read John Dewey, I have read, but that doesn't mean when I write a text uh, evoking a fine building by Caesar or whatever, that I have to drop all those names. No. Uh, I much prefer to pick up Ruskin, uh, who didn't even have phenomenology and who utterly beautifully evokes uh, aspects of Venetian buildings. So part of it is a literary question and, uh, you know, ideas, our language is wonderful without jargon. Uh, you know, I don't know, Turkish language is probably also absolutely marvelous for evoking things. So the issue yes, of jargon is. is that we don't need, and anyway, phenomenology is going to put the public off. It's going to, that's, that's addressed to, to somebody in particular. But if that's, if that's your thing, you see, I object to architectural writing that drops names all over the place of philosophers, of, okay, okay. That's what I meant by jargon, single. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Sylvia. Yes, I would like to, that if you could expand a little bit the difference between the view of the historian and the view of the critic, because it seems to me um, derived from your, your talk that both have in common the relationship between uh, many uh, isolated masterpieces. So the narrative are, is constructed uh, on the relationship of these masterpieces. Uh, uh, probably for, uh, I don't know, I, I think that derived from your, your talk, uh, the, the critic uh, relates it um, through certain categories like style uh, or authenticity uh, in their specific uh, uh, places and cultures. Uh, but the historian uh, has to appeal to other types of relationships through time, like influence uh, that permits to create a, a, a narrative on the time. On time, uh, I would like if you could expand a little bit this difference uh, when talking about quality. 
Yes, I mean, uh, it seems to me that, um, or at least I can only speak for myself, but when I uh, involve myself in a critical reflection on a building, which I did in a lecture of, of three days ago in, in, uh, in Pamplona, uh, one of the buildings, I gave a talk called On Transforming Le Corbusier. Uh, and among the transformations, by the way, was the um, <laughs> the building by Salmona, which I like so much. But the one I concentrated well on was the one which they'd just seen, which is another building by Say and Stoisa, is the Otesa Museum. Now, the Otesa Museum, which you may or may not know outside Pamplona, is a highly self-conscious work by Otesa, which is full of um, internal dialogues of his own with modern architecture, including Corbusier, it's un uncanny the number of things that he's engaging with from La Tourette, from here, from there, from the other. Uh, so on the one side, one is talking about uh, that building as uh, a relative success or not, as a place to see the works of Orteza, and it's actually a very mixed blessing. Uh, one is talking about the priorities that the architect set, some of which uh, achieve things, but immediately created problems elsewhere in the building. At the same time, one is asking the question, where, why did he use this set of forms rather than another one? And that is partly a historical question. It's saying that we enter his design process and we realize he's obsessed with this and obsessed with that. Now that's what happened, if you like, 40 years ago when he designed it. We are in the present, we look at the results and we assess the good and the bad of it. But the, I don't see any contradiction between uh, analyzing, um, you know, a building in terms of its present condition and its uh, um, even even its moment of creation uh, in the culture of architecture, and looking into its pedigree. I mean, why ever not? In fact, I think it's rather desirable that one should investigate how the architect looked at at that architect's precedents. I cannot see if it's, if there are any hands raised. I see Wilfred has a hand. Yeah, I would uh, just like to add to Sylvia's question. I don't think you can be an architectural historian without being critical, and I don't think you can be an architectural critic without knowing architectural history. So I think these, these uh, uh, realms are not uh, separate. Uh, they're, in fact, one and the same. Um, you can concentrate uh, as a professional more on the writing of architectural history, but in the end, you always have to make selections. You have to concentrate on certain buildings that you think are relevant, and you will uh, omit others that you don't think are relevant. And by that, you are already making a judgment. You're making a critical statement. So uh, it seems a little uh, obvious as a statement, but uh, I, I do think that there are uh, these these things are synthetic. De definitely, I mean, I mean, back back to the issue of masterpieces. Obviously, I've taken uh, you know a rhetorical stand uh, in in this uh, in this piece in, in in defense of excellence or what, the wonderful Goethe. Uh, what was it again? In art, the best is good enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, ex ex excellence, why, why not? Especially in a world that's so full of devaluation, of kitsch, of, of trivialization and so on. You know, let's go for it. But that doesn't mean that those are the only things in the history of architecture that one is interested in. As a matter of fact, one of the things that fascinates me is uh, the question of, of uh, common language or generic language and then high moments of expression, prose on the one side, and poetry on the other, or of vernaculars, or of the devaluation of prime objects into um, secondary, third, and so on. I was always fascinated as a student, as student by um, Kubler's Shape of Time, um, which I'm sure you all know in some way or another, uh, a book that uh, posits in the history of things and the history of forms, the idea of prime prime moments, or let's say exemplary moments, or we would say paradigmatic moments. And I think that um, it's not necessarily one and the same thing, but the so-called masterpiece often takes on the role of um, a paradigm because it has, it becomes seminal because it's crystallized the ambiguities and complexities of a situation. 
That's where its relevance comes from. That's why people bother to look at it and, and, and uh, be influenced by it. If it didn't do that, it's not just a question of formal power. It's because it gathers up a whole lot of issues of a moment in the culture and gives these a very resonant form in terms of, uh, of architecture. And that seminality leads others to look at it and gradually um, transform it or, or do things with it. In, in the, the second edition of um, my book on, on Le Corbusier, um, the, the Le Corbusier Ideas and Forms, I added a chapter at the end, which is called On Transforming Le Corbusier, which looks at that paradigmatic role and the many readings in all directions up and down and in contrast to each other. And for example, um, I looked at the, the vaulted uh, prototype of Corbusier, starting with the Monol, going through the Petite Maison du Weekend, going on into Maison Sarabai, and talked about the way that deep prototype influences Salmona in one direction and Doshi in another, but it's the same ancestral root. Uh, at the same time, some of these forms become, you know, generalized vernaculars. So really the, the, the position of the masterpiece is not standing in complete isolation. Uh, it's drawn upon, you know, very many general, general statements and it leads to, leads to others. Are there any hands raised? Oh. I see a, a hand and a gentleman in the blue shirt. <laughs> uh, for Anton. some reason, Thank I you. can't see Anton. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you so much for the lecture. Um, wanted just to ask a very general, broad question. If you might want to elaborate more on the definition of authenticity, that seems quite central in what you were saying. And that's such a rich, deep word that I'm sure can take on so many nuances in everyone's mind in a different way here. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, could you elaborate on that word a little bit more? Well, yes. I mean, um, first of all, I want to, to, to uh, restate what I said. I got involved with that notion at a particular period in the history of, of, of architecture. Um, it happened in the following way. I was invited to Yale, the only occasion I've ever been invited there actually, and um, uh, was quite preoccupied already. This was in 79, I guess, or no, 80, 80, spring 80, by um, the trivialization of history, which I saw going on in schools of architecture. Um, it was, um, you know, we were coming up to strata novissima, to postmodernism, to Jenks, to this, to that. Um, and I felt that um, there was a trivialization of history, uh, an inauthenticity, uh, if you will. Uh, and against that, one needed to take some sort of a stand. So I gave this talk uh, in, in Yale, which used that word. And at the end of the talk, this three people came up and said, hi, we are Perspector 20. I said, what? <laughs> we are Perspector 20. I said, well, what's that? Well, we're the editors of the next uh, Perspector. And we're fascinated by this, this notion. I said, well, okay, uh, uh, good luck. And anyway, I get phone calls at 10.30 at night for several months. Well, but this is what we're thinking. Well, they put together, I'd like to invite you to dig out Perspective 20 and see a range of views on this. Uh, and of um, build, you know, uh, it took, was already taking a stand in a certain sense against um, a definite feeling of trivialization in, in architecture. And you will find in there a whole range of things. The thing I did on the two great parliaments of Corbusier and Kahn, uh, Kenneth Frampton to, uh, towards a critical regionalism. One of his versions is in there. Um, there's some very fine writing on Scarpa, on Ando, uh, and so forth. In other words, people were looking for more solid anchors than this candy floss that was, that was passing and this populism and semiology, a kind of trivialized semiology, trivialized typology. I had a go yesterday at, at uh, uh, you know, Rossi. I mean, it was embarrassing to see the level of discussion in places like the Graduate School of Distraction, uh, <laughs> GSD, which was just down the road. And I thought, I cannot stand all this, you know? And, and so I decide to take a stand. Uh, and so does this help you a bit? It was in a context. So coming back to it, uh, authenticity suggests a deeper content. 
uh, it, excess, it, it suggests a crystallization of an ethos, uh, of, of you know, a notion of what the world ought to be. I think the, one of the um, roles of major works is to develop a sort of a, a microcosm of a, a, a paradise of some sort or an ideal world. Um, but doing this in a way that's not simply literary or cluttering with references, but somehow deeply embedded in the resonance of the work itself. So this got me into or carried on a reflection I'd had for a long time about the distinction between symbols and signs. That where signs were largely conventional, symbols suggest a much deeper notion of resonance capable of capturing uh, multiple levels of content. And so I think multiple levels of content was also one of my criteria. But these, these ideas had grown out of years of uh, reflection, including the work I did on Carpenter Center 10 years early, digging into the design process of that building, the writings on the Villa Savoie, uh, and so on and so forth. And an avoidance of these totally uh, trivializing uh, uh, formulae that were buzzing around architecture schools, including uh, the kind of Colin Rowe clout crowd and their little tricks and, you know, Palladio this and that. I mean, I, I was really, really uh, uh, sort of disturbed uh, by the trivialization of architecture. And, and uh, at that point, one draws on one's experience. You know, I mean, I've been to India. Uh, I spend a lot of my life looking at ancient architecture. Even in those days, I would travel around the Middle East. You know, when, when you've been to, to uh, uh, Luxor and looked at the... Uh, the temples there, uh, it's a little hard to come back to Charles Moore or to... <laughs> okay, okay, we got it. Uh, well, we, we have um, uh, some two minutes left. Yes, so man. Wilfred has raised his hand. Do you want to say something, Wilfred? Car um, Carlos, Carlos first. Yes, um, uh, I was glad that uh, you mentioned Paradigm and then you mentioned Kubler. So we have Kuhn and... Uh, the Kublerian sense uh, series in, uh, in the conversation. So when we are talking of a masterpiece, shouldn't we distinguish between uh, uh, a piece that is one, uh, that is the first of its class that is original, that opens, you know, promises and, uh, and the best, meaning, you know, the perfect realization of uh, things that were uh, only um, uh, painted at in, uh, in uh, the original uh, launching of the series? Well, I, I would say that in order for something, uh, that, that there is no sort of sudden first step. Uh, there's always um, a, a, a complex pedigree behind the work that appears to be a total innovation. And so therefore, for it to be in that position at all, it's got to be pulling on an awful lot of wisdom and knowledge and know-how to achieve that state. Uh, once it's achieved that state, um, it's, it's not responsible for its future. Uh, it's how people reread it. Um, and um, some years ago, I wrote a piece about Corbusier called Le Corbusier, A Mirror and a Lens meaning on the one hand that his, his prototypes, and we could be talking about uh, uh, Palladio's prototypes or Bermantes or, or many other things in the history of architecture or right, that they are there potent uh, and that people um, bounce off them to discover their direction. At the same time, they identify a cluster of problems through them and then they transform and carry on. And that is how a tradition is formed, including the modern tradition. Um, you know, our, 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 our dear friend Niemeyer, so profoundly understood, and Costa, bravo, uh, understood deeply the implications of Corbusier and pulled, pulled it forward very quickly. I was looking again at my photographs of Pampuya, where we met uh, my dear Eduardo Cobb, <laughs> uh, of, of the casino, which is a totally astonishing uh, reinvention of the free plan of the space that was implied by, by Corbusier, but taking it even further in another direction. Once he's done that, others go further. I, I think this is the way it works with a series of high intensities uh, along, along the line. And the result is a chain of solutions which constitute uh, a tradition. Of course. Thank you. You're afraid? If I may uh, offer some kind of... Uh, um my reading or, or, and a summary of your presentation, William. I think um, the great thing about this um, uh, recording and later on the publication of your paper 
is that people will be able to uh, derive from a deep reading of your paper a methodology. Uh, and I don't use the word methodology in a, a negative way. On the contrary, I think one of the purposes of this conference is um, for uh, scholars uh, interested in uh, evaluating buildings to derive a methodology. And I, you began by talking about uh, variables such as site use, social situation, uh, underlying intentions, um, and uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. I think it's possible to to state that uh, as a kind of a core. Um, uh, and, and so that's one thing. Uh, but I think uh, to come back to the central topic of your presentation, when you speak about the um, the general and the universal, uh, or the unique and the universal, the uh, the highest aspiration that architects can have or a building can have is for it to offer uh, a perspective on the future of civilization. Mm. And in that, it becomes a universal uh, option, of course, albeit with the you know local cultural differences, climatic differences, etc. But architects are uh, to use uh, you know the notion that Nelson Goodman uh, talked about, they are defining ways of making a world. Mm. Yes, and yes. a building is a way of world making. Yeah. Or, or to use another um, terminology that uh, uh, another colleague, uh, art historian, Dagobert Frey, spoke about. He spoke about the character of reality. In other words, we know a work of art or a work of architecture is only a small element. But if it were to be re reproduced, it would constitute a larger reality. And how would the world then look if that were the case? And so in projecting that, taking on the responsibility to uh, formulate something that is more uh, embracing than just the individual solution for a particular yeah. problem in a site, that is the ultimate aspiration that the building can have. And so if one were to say, what are the, what are the different levels of uh, architectural quality? If the Vitruvian triad is a base, commodity firmness and delight, if there are other things in the middle, such as the integrity that you talked about, the aesthetic and, and ethical integrity, the compositional integrity, those are things that are um, signs of the artifice, the, the, the quality of the designer itself, how things, how elements relate to holes, etc. But then there is the, uh, the issue of the aspiration towards uh, a greater goal for civilization. And I think that, that those different levels are, are levels of architectural quality, which can be investigated by deep readings. I'm afraid we are run out of time. Uh, and uh, we haven't spoke about the city, but um, okay, <laughs> uh, we'll have uh, 10 minutes uh, theoretically. So we should start not before, uh, uh, after 10 minutes. So it would be uh, 15, 15.45 instead. Okay, we'll see. Let's see. Okay. Thank you so much, William. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much.
No. <laughs> William, thank you very much for uh, a wonderful presentation. Sure. Um, well, you know, the point you're making, um, I'm fully aware of, it's actually a question almost a pedagogical. Uh, am I on? Can you hear yes. me? Oh, yes. yes. Um, <clears throat> you know, of, of method, um, it, which is, um, <clears throat> you know, I put it rather crudely. Um, description, analysis, and evaluation, um, so that uh, one encourages people, first of all, to see, see what they see, experience what they experience, but then begin to really analyze what's going on in a sequence, of course, and in changing light, then get to the formal structure and spatial structure of the work, then gradually penetrate, let's say, the ideational level, what's going on, which may involve historical research or, or guesswork or whatever, but what, what, what's the sort of inner image of a building? What's, what's bringing it alive? Which means the intangibles actually, which are very important and, and one can't describe them exactly, but one can describe the effect they have. And then by degrees, um, you know, look at, you know, conflicts and things, you know, this works well, but this doesn't work well. I mean, this wonderful church by Otesa is wonderful inside, but it's a hell of a mess outside. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <It can't. laughs> so, but the, but the central point uh, that you, uh, you didn't dwell on, but that is absolutely uh, self-evident is that the work itself is the primary evidence. Oh, yes. Not uh, the pre and post rationalization. So, uh, certainly not what the architects write or speak about themselves. Yes, right? well, uh, so uh, it's like, you know, the, the deed itself, irrespective of the authors, uh, is to be evaluated on its own terms, first of all. And then, of course, yeah. you can always evaluate it in relation to what the architects or the clients had in mind and whether they failed or succeeded, relatively speaking. Uh, absolutely. Uh, but the point is that, you know, there are people, architectural historians and architectural critics who call themselves that, who can't read buildings, who absolutely. can't read plans, who, who well, can only read text, yes. and who think that because of their, their reading the text, that is certainly what the architects uh, intended, and that's what they did. Yeah, oh, no, it's totally naive. And I mean, I did say that, actually, that we have to be like a, a psychoanalyst Absolutely. listening yeah. and saying, no, yes, yes, no. yes. I understood that. And I'm, I'm just saying that, you know. Oh, it's crucial. Yeah. Um, and the, it's very much, I mean, it's interesting how I, I, I don't follow the state of uh, architectural education that much, but you can definitely um, discern area, places where people are thinking very much textually and not formally, like Etiha. There's a younger generation of people who are all obsessed with what Gideon said about this and that. And I'm thinking, who cares, you know? And, but, you know, if it's not written and it's not in a document, then they, they don't know what to say because they can't read a building as a document. But I've always said to me, the building is the first document um, with all the caution that's needed about saying that because you're looking at something which was created at an earlier time. Um, so I'm interested in that duality, the, the immediate experience, but with all the caution of then saying, hold on a second, I may love this bare concrete or whatever, they hated it at the time or vice versa. Um, you know, this is marble, which was a sacred material at the time and was handled in this way for that reason. So that's why everything you say is, you know, there's no distinction between a good historian and a good critic. I mean, they, they should be moving up and down the time scale all the time, all the time. And that's what I've attempted to do in my various uh, uh, texts. But um, I mean, I wouldn't bother to write about things if I didn't find them very moving, you know. <laughs> sure. I gave a, a talk many, many years ago here in Berlin uh, at the Wissenschaftszentrum, 
uh, to people who weren't architects or architectural historians or architectural critics. And I spoke about the uh, the principle of cladding that Zempel okay. wrote about and um, uh, and gave as an example uh, both Otto Wagner and Adolf Loos, you know, pretty obvious uh, candidates. Oh, yeah. uh, after the lecture, one of the members of the audience came up to me and said, how can you say that? Uh, where did where did Wagner write about this idea about uh, clothing and cladding? And how can you claim that uh, the way that the church on the Stein, uh, Steinhof had the marble uh, cladding, that that is an idea about uh, clothing? And, you know, and, and I just had to say, <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, what, what can I say? And of course, uh, Wagner makes reference in in his book, um, Modern Architecture, to Zemper, but he didn't yeah. explicitly write, and this is what the, the questioner wanted to know, did he explicitly write about the idea of uh, fixing the panels as a way of ex exemplifying Zemper's uh, principle of cladding? That's... So he said, you can't say that, it's hermeneutics. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Well, there are ways of saying things as an interpretation where it's entirely clear that one's making an interpretation, but there's a the very strong suggestion that it's fact, you know. Um, and uh, no, I know, I, I know what you mean. I, I, uh, <laughs> I had to toss in at one point in my because you know there's there's some tension with our Brazilian colleagues. Uh, about you know th this whole thing of I, I don't know what uh, Ruth uh, what's it, wrote about my book, but this Western this and Western that. I mean, I've been so involved with Latin America and so involved with India and so involved. So I just put in one or two little little barbs about that. And actually, I'm thinking a lot about <laughs> the whole Latin American situation because I'm honoured to do a keynote in the Biennale of Latin American Architecture in Quito in a month and. I want to go and learn from that, and I think it'll be very instructive. And I'm longing to know more about the, you know, the emerging generations and what they're struggling with. And and uh, uh, it's great. I'm very excited about it, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you should uh, try and meet the colleagues from um, Alborde. From where? Sorry. Alborde, who are in Quito. Oh, I don't know. A group of a group of architects, young architects. Oh, okay. Let me let me know. I'll, I mean, I'll put sure. you in touch with uh, by email. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay, we are we are going to be on. I don't know where Carlos is or where Fernando, the, the two, the two moderators who post, who are supposed to now introduce the next speaker. It's very amusing to see the settings that we're all in. Of course, the very serious people have books like you. Um, I have a <laughs> piano that's hidden behind me, <laughs> and the river lot in front of me. <laughs> I think your your wife has been uh, walking up and down in the in the room. Oh, did you I catch? <laughs> she was playing the piano very beautifully next door for some of the time, and then uh, oh, she appears and disappears. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's been it's it was stimulating, but I thought I should really you know develop these ideas much further than I usually do and try and put them in a coherent form. Um, and um, I, I can see there are all kinds of uh, zones that I could develop much much further, but. Uh, uh, you know, the, the proof of the pudding is the quality of one's critical pieces. You know, this is thought about thought. This is what this is. And sure. you know, at the end, I, I, I like writing very pithy articles that dig in, that, that, you know, reveal a situation, which is my answer to our Turkish colleague, that uh, uh, in the end, it's the quality of your writing that can evoke the poetics. Or you're, you're right. You're right on that sense. But I think we're also here to... Uh, give guidance to the next generations of architectural historians and critics. And I think that um, because there's not really an explicit and up-to-date uh, set of definitions of what architectural quality is, um, we need to uh, talk no. more explicitly about methodologies, right? So this is, the, this is one of the points uh, of this uh, series of conferences. Well, I, I could uh, certainly do, a, you know, I mean, if you put it that way, a, a part two that would uh, say, take four or five conditions of the work of architecture and theorize around them. In other words, right. let's talk about what do, we, what do we mean when we experience a building? Blah, 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 and here are some philosophical uh, uh, touchstones. 
uh, meaning. What do we mean by meaning? I mean, one could one could do that, you know, and then bring it back to a demonstration in in one example or, or something of the the kind. I think that if I were more frequently a teacher, I would probably be doing that more. You know, I mean, I'm very, very rarely sitting in a seminar room with some bright 25 year olds, you know, it's extremely rare. But when you do that, you are you know, involved in a different kind of way of explaining. You're also getting them to go and do work. Well, my, my experience has been, and we need to move on. My experience okay. has been that um, um, young um, students uh, in architecture need this kind of explicit methodology. Yeah, yeah. No, I see what you're saying. Well, maybe I should write a little book. <laughs> yeah, your next book. Fernando, over okay. to you. Uh, uh, Douglas... Can we wait uh, for Carlos Eduardo? Douglas is there, and uh, we can continue. Okay, just a minute. Of if, if we see if Carlos Eduardo is arriving to his seat. Okay, well, we can go on. Let's see. Uh, well, our first presentation uh, of this morning by Douglas Aguiar will be on the role of walking in architecture. Architecture quality as a special performance. So Douglas Aguiar is based in the Department of Architecture of um, Universidad Federal do Rio Grande do Sul, Porto Alegre, Brazil. So welcome, Douglas. If hello. You... Hello. Are you listening <laughs> well to me? Are you hearing me? Yes, we are hearing you. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. I feel very well in this very good company. Thank you. Uh, I want to share my screen with you. Let me do it now. No, this is not this. I will share my whole screen then. Are you seeing it? Yes, you can enlarge it. So we... Let me see if I can do it. Okay, it... that's it. It's working. Let me take this thing here out of my view. Well, uh, this paper is called on the, on the Role of Walking in Architecture. Architecture Quality as Spatial Performance. Well, the central proposition offered in this paper is that the essential, the inherent and most intrinsic quality of architecture would lie in its spatial performance. The concept of uh, spatial performance I'm proposing refers to the way space is delivered by buildings and urban settings welcome people, the users, by providing either receptive and intelligible uh, spatial situations or, on the contrary, unsuitable or even hostile spaces. The, the work in hypothesis is quite uh, 
obvious in view of uh, the concept itself is that buildings in urban settings perform so producing spatial effects upon people. Two descriptions of spatial performance I am proposing. One from the perceptual standpoint and other from the configurational standpoint. The perceptual description of spatial performance will be explored in terms of the condition of legibility and commodity verified along the route, the pathway followed by the user, observer, in a spatial situation. Uh, the configurational dimension of spatial performance will be scrutinized in, in, in its planimetric uh, description as something that comes from the mode of arrangement presented by the spaces of a building. That's to say its combinatorial dimension. Uh, I will present a theoretical construction of the concept of spatial performance uh, based on the word of a set of selected authors. Uh, these authors are very well known uh, uh, for you. Schmarzo, Hildebrandt, uh, German historians, Paul Frankel, Le Corbusier. So architects and, the and theorists and uh, architects that theorize. I put together the, the words of these people trying to uh, give a sort of support for this notion of uh, 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 spatial performance and its uh, preponderance, its predominance in the concept of architecture itself. I would say that more important that, than these authors themselves is the way the concepts they present have become articulated in the formulation of a theory of speciality. At the end of the presentation, I will, I will present uh, an empirical construction uh, putting into practice what I, I call the method of the, the observer, the observer as a procedure to the assessment of the spatial performance of a building. This uh, sort of uh, procedure I use very much in, in my, my teaching at the PROPAR at the, the university in, in Porto Alegre. Such method consists basically in the use of the walk as a method of study in architecture. In such procedures, sequences of images capture along the route and planimetric descriptions of the same route are put together. Lines of movement and lines of sight are described in plan. Deficits of legibility and commodity are registered as parameters in the assessment of spatial performance. As case studies, two building, buildings will be compared from the standpoint of their spatial performance. The New York Guggenheim Museum by Frank Lloyd Wright and the Museum uh, Iberia Camargo Foundation uh, by Alvaro Cis in Porto Alegre. Well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going, I, I made a sort of selection of these authors and it's quite likely that you have come across. So I'm, I'm not going in detail into it. I, I'm, I'm just uh, picking up the main ideas of these, these people. Uh, Shimarso, he brought to us this notion of the loss of directional axis. And I, am, I, I have this paragraph here. And he says, as soon as we have learned to experience ourselves and ourselves alone as the center of space whose coordinates intersect in us, 
we have found the precious kernel, the initial capital investment, so to speak, on which architectural creation is based. Even if for the moment it seems no more impressive than a lucky penny, once the ever active imagination takes hold of this germ and develops it according to the laws of directional axis, inherent in even the smallest nucleus of every spatial idea, the grain of the mustard seed grows into a tree and an entire world surrounds us. This is the notion of the a sort of, um, I would say, configurational, uh, spatial notion that is embedded in this loss of directional axis I've, I've selected. He also says, only when the axis of depth is fairly extensive, will the shelter, the hideout, grow into a living space in which we do not feel trapped, but freely choose to stay and leave. I also asked the help of uh, Le Corbusier. Uh, Le Corbusier and the architectural promenade, he says, an axis is perhaps the first human manifestation. It is the means of every human act. The toddling child moves along an axis. A man striving in the tempest of life traces for himself an axis. An axis is the regulator of architecture. To establish order is to begin to work architecture is based on axis. Arrangement is the grading of axis, and so it is the grading of aims and the classification of intentions. Well, in the gradation of axis are implicit the concepts of spatial integration, spatial segregation, the moving visible and the less visible, the more accessible, the less accessible, the gradation of axis will contribute with the spatial effect in the realization of activity. I, we can see here a sort of amplified uh, description of what we normally call function. Well, this dealing with axiality for these guys in the beginning of uh, last century was uh, something quite uh, recurrent. I'm, I'm taking here the, the exam example of, uh, let me go back. Uh, other examples. I will take a bit of, uh, in, in this argument, I will take a bit of, they say that my connection is not good. What is it? Just a moment, please. Uh, Zevi, the role of the walk in architecture, the interior space as Zevi that space that cannot be represented by any means, that cannot be known and explored unless by virtue of direct experience. This is the main protagonist of architecture. He also says, any architecture, if it is to be understood and lived, will take the time of our walk. It is the presence of the body that eventually will bring about the approval and the condemnation of all aesthetic sentences in architecture. All the rest is important, can become important, although it will always be a consequence of spatial conception. <coughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Douglas. Douglas yeah? I'm sorry. Um, I think you should go quite faster because time is running out. 
Um, okay. Maybe you can go faster through the these definitions and go directly to the works presented. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, <coughs> Herzberger. Perceptual categories. I use two categories in order to, to do this assessment of spatial performance. Legibility, whether the move, moving observer is capable of perceiving or understanding the continuity and discontinuity of the pathway in front of him. Huh? And commodity, that refers to corporeal well-being. Instrumental categories. The plan is the first and main instrumental category. Uh, the pathway is the second. And the third is the view field. What is seen by the moving observer. The, the method of analysis put together plans, lines of movement, lines of sight. This is an application of this, this method. Uh, can you uh, enlarge, please, the, um, again, the, mm -hmm. the screen? Enlarge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Well, I'm going through the case study. It uh, compares uh, the Iberia Camargo Museum and the um, Guggenheim in, in New York. And uh, many people have uh, 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 have written about uh, the, the uh, similitudes of these uh, buildings. They actually the images below uh, seems to confirm the similarities. Simi suggests that Caesar has taken Wright's building as a model, firstly in its uh, exterior image, where Wright's circular ramps go through a sort of origami folding metamorphosis. And second, in the plan, plan distribution that shows the two buildings having exhibitions positioned around, around monumental voids. Yet for Caesar, the void has a more complex constitution with its cantilevered sinuous ramps with hatches, as compared to right, where it is entirely surrounded by exhibitions. These images also show the peculiar way uh, Caesar plays with the root of the visitor throughout the building, which is rather opposite of Wright's way. While Wright's strategy is to set up a pattern of visual connection between visitors around the void, Caesar's strategy is to put the visitor in a permanent condition of visual disconnection by adding to the circuit of visitation a number of tubular walkways positioned uh, spectacularly. Uh, let me see. At the exterior of the building. These images illustrate this point I was talking about. Well, the, the method of the observer, you can see in these, in these images, in the, the, the person that have done this uh, work has visited, it's and Andrea Coleman, it's a student of mine at, the, at Propar. She was there and she, in these diagrams uh, compare uh, it's rather interesting the way a Caesar and Wright, they, both of them, they hide 
the entrance door, you see in Caesar, this line of sight seems to be a door, but the door is actually there at the, at the left, hidden at the left. In the right, the same thing. The, this uh, door in front of the, um, right in front, ahead in the root, and you have the entrance door here at the, the right, hidden. It's interesting also to compare the way these, uh, in, in the um, uh, ground floor, especially the position, uh, uh, what is offered to the visitor. And the, um, in the case of right, you have the entrance of the ramp and the lift, they are very much side by side. And well, in the case of, of Caesar, you have uh, the elevators hidden. They are there at the end. And even you have a small hole putting it uh, even uh, behind. So it's a sort of um, uh, strategy, spatial strategy of Caesar play, permanently playing with, um, with the visitor. In the, uh, the, the uh, circuit uh, of... Uh, sorry, Douglas, but we yeah. have consumed the time of the questions also, I, so you... I am, I am just speaking. I am just in. Okay, uh, okay. You, you have here this comparison of the, the, the roots and how Caesar uh, creates this fantastic space of disconnection. Well, I, I have a final note uh, that I would like to, to read for you. Uh, the, the relevance of uh, spatiality, that is the, the, the main uh, point of this uh, speech and of this presentation, that spatiality has a dynamic, a form of space and the movement of the body that interact and modify each other. So speciality is not neutral. It may either, either help or prevent the proper performance of the body. Research on speciality seems to be essential in architecture as far as, as, far as it propitiates the assessment of the way spaces work in view of the demands of the body and to put it politically, demands of people, individually and collectively. Eventually, the acknowledgement of architecture from the standpoint of spatiality aims at the recovery of the essential values of architecture as social art. Many thanks. Thank you. Douglas, I'm sorry we uh, have such a short span of time, uh, but um, we don't want to get uh, to consume uh, time from the following um, uh, the following presentation. So um, I don't know. Uh, can you stop sharing, please, your screen so we see each other? Let me see how can I do it. Here it is. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I, I don't know if we have a, a space for for questions be, uh, because of time has run out. So we, I'm sorry, but we should move forward to the next presentation. Uh, Carlos Eduardo. your micro. Uh, are you there, Councilman? Yes, yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, yes. 
Go yes, ahead. Uh, without further ado, let me call uh, Vishnu and Hamzika uh, so that they can begin their presentation, please. Is Vishnu there? Yeah. Okay. Am I audible? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, is this being visible? No. Yes. Your image is visible. All right. All right. All right. So, uh, architectural discourse uh, about quality seldom goes beyond the palpable experience. So the way the light comes in, the feel of the space, the volume, the scale, the texture, the acoustics, the ergonomics, etc., occupy the generic list of rubrics when dissecting architectural quality. Uh, cultural appropriation and questions of identity are, and belonging also become recurrent concerns in such a discourse where it occupies the contextual gravitas. For instance, uh, we always say building does not seem to occur, remains examined only to its visual limit. It is mostly that we get stuck to geometric cues that the vital concerns of socio-politics and primary human context are obscurely forgotten and only how everything seems to the eye remains. The elephant in the room that remain, remains hardly addressed is how the design emerges with specificities of context and conditions, the individual and the societal. Do they, out of typicality or templates, even when circumstances that require architectural solutions are almost always different? What goes unsought to is what gives birth to design is specificities and relationship at all levels guide them. The formal relationship with functional, the tectonics, the adjacencies, the circulation, how everything comes together to form a unity. Relationships are seldom accounted for as qualitative, but affect the quality of architecture even more than the aforementioned rub rubrics. Here, the relationships are between one space and another, a time with the inhabitants and their concerning human conditions, memory, and how all of them interrelate in the given architecture. We have uh, two case studies to present. The first being uh, uh, number 11, 33rd lane. This is the residence of the famous architect Jeffrey Baba from Sri Lanka. So uh, this is the private residence of the architect Jeffrey Baba, designed to accommodate his guest suite and his home office in an upscale neighborhood in Colombo. It was occupied for over uh, 40 years. Uh, the guest suite was used as the home office for some time. One of the uh, rooms uh, in one of the garden rooms became an elevator shaft after some time. Uh, and at present, it is a museum that is uh, left for uh, Bawa's architecture. And this is the ionic drawing of number 11, which was designed incrementally. All the programmatic growth that you see happened around the master bedroom. As we seem to enter the house uh, in Sorry the plan. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, um, I, uh, Vishnu, yeah. I think your slides are not changing. Yes, slides are not changing. Just a minute. Uh, Um, no. Is it visible? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, Next image, I think you need to press. Yeah. Can you? Okay. All right. Yeah. Now. Yeah, it's changing. Yeah. Is it changing? Yeah. So as we move into the house and the plan, uh, the house unfolds as a series 
difference. Um, so at places it's the greens, at places it's the water, or at places even the, how light is drawn into the house in an otherwise dark intimate space. So this is the plan uh, and the diagram that shows the corresponding picturesque frames. So the subspace and the following frame that frames the picturesque. Uh, reading out what Bhava said in one of his interviews was that the site gives the most powerful push to a design along with the brief. Without seeing the site, it, I cannot work. It is essential to be there. After two hours on the site, I have a mental picture of what will be there and how the site will change and the picture does not change. And here I am to stress on the fact that the picture never changes for Baba. Uh, zooming out, the, uh, the all the other servant spaces or the, uh, the spaces of utility were uh, actually decentralized in the plan. And uh, spaces such as the kitchen, the toilet, the storage rooms, the office space, uh, uh, they don't, uh, like, uh, they're not highlighted as much as uh, the other picturesque frames uh, that we saw in the previous slide. Uh, the servant's room, uh, interestingly, shows no, not even a window uh, for air to go out. The whole design of the house reaches to the heart of modern architecture of the, uh, the concept architectural promenade. Uh, we experience the house as a series of frames as it unfolds and enters into the house is starkly unidirectional. But the performance of the servant block uh, that you can see in this uh, does not work for the servant at all. And the whole house was never imagined through the lens of the servant who occupies most of the time of the house. The primary kitchen also caters to the floor above, in which case the circulation is more cumbersome for the servant. None of the design decisions have been made in keeping in mind the servant of the house, who is an important inhabitant of the house. There is a there is an opportunity for a secondary circulation, which is oblivious to the visitor's encounter. Uh, here, apart from the backstage exit, uh, which you can see in the green, the circulation in and around the courtyards is very limited to the adjacent space that frames it. Keeping in um, keeping these garden rooms. I think you're checked. Sorry to interrupt rooms, again. Yeah. Uh, Vishnu, maybe I can share the screen. Your uh, there is some issue with the presentation. Right. Pardon. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, we'll go. Can you see the screen? Slide. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Next. Yeah. So there is a secondary circulation that you can see marked in the green, which is oblivious to the visitor's encounter. So apart from the backstage exit, uh, the garden rooms underutilized in architectural circulation. Uh, next. So we did to briefly change the plan and how certain things could be changed and radically transform the way the house functions. So maybe just a clearing up of the backstage exit, which could make uh, the circulation more significant. The life of the servant, who is uh, perhaps a very important member of the house, more easier. Uh, what I want to end this case with is uh, with this note that Bhava's residence falls short on vital relationships that the residence requires. Miguel, the servant's block around which the mansion incremented is a problem in the design that the iconic rendered plan forgets to bring to notice. The project is known famously for its photographs before the picturesque, but beneath the picturesque, there is a crucial latent shortcoming. So by incursing each of the picturesque, the proposal that I have done is uh, allows a subtle subversion of the choreographed views while still maintaining it. 
The resultant circulation allows a cyclical movement around the house, akin to a courtyard house, while still preserving the essence of the picturesque. Now we'll move on to the second case study, which is the Gandhi Ashram. Um, a museum built to memorialize Mahatma Gandhi and his legacy, located within the Gandhi Ashram in Ahmedabad, designed by Charles Korea. Six meters by six meter modular grid was adapted with spaces open and closed, allowing for future expansion. It currently houses Gandhi's letters, photographs, and galleries, exhibiting key moments that happened during independence. During the course of time, new structures were added and the spaces built for residing have started converting into museums and spaces for public use. Before jumping onto the memorial, Gandhi's philosophy and attitude in setting up the ashram was based on individual and societal aspects. Where the individual talks about how to conduct oneself, that is through daily rituals and the act of working, helping to embody knowledge. The second being societal, the way you conduct with fellow men, that is, especially with the people of the weaker society. The extent of the Gandhi Ashram is much bigger than the context just immediate to the Memorial Museum. It's spread across both sides of the um, Ashram Road over here. And programs related to holistic education, nutrition, health and hygiene, women empowerment, more, all of these catering to the most marginalized society used to happen around the site. These are the practices that keep the ashram alive through the act of self-reliance and self-practice. Now, if we zoom in to the vicinity site plan of the Memorial Museum, it's being situated in the northern corner of the site and Charaka Museum onto the right hand with books and khadi shops occupying the left center and with Parikshit Ashramalaya, which is a housing for uh, children and Manav Sadhana over here uh, is a place for human practices located in the southern site and Hridai Kunj, where Gandhiji used to live, located almost in the center of the site. And before the memorial uh, museum was built, these all these tiny structures had a very specific relationship between themselves and the built environment around. And for example, in case of Hridai Kunj, the high plinth built for climatic purpose meets the ground in such a way that it holds a large open space in front and solely with its veranda, veranda being a small open space in front. And uh, it used to cater to all the act different activities that happen in the year. It tries to make a relationship of keeping intact of the open space in front with its tiny build. Parikshit Ashamala and Manav Sadna face each other, forming a smaller courtyard and having a no plinth contributes to the diffusion between the built and its environment, allowing children to gather and play. Hence, the relationship between program and architectural gesture go hand in hand. In case of the two houses, the plinth is not limited to the immediate built it is surrounded with, but it gradually diffuses with the built environment and activities such as washing hands, drinking water used to happen in these spaces, which becomes places of social infrastructure. And the built, infrastructure and the built structures almost take a backseat in this scenario. After the addition of the Memorial Museum over here, the low wall and a tiny ramp built at the entrance tend to create a territory in itself and becomes a point of separation from its own context. Paved path and brick planters cut the site almost into two halves, that is the Memorial Museum and the rest of the ashram. A unified plinth makes each, each of these spaces of the museum to be treated as an object to enter and go rather than making a relationship with the built environment. And the floating plinth detail over here further accentuates the separation from its common ground. Addition of hard pavement and planters near the Charaka Museum further creates more boundaries and sets apart from its own context. And in, in, and in times when foreign delegates access the ashram, the vehicular entry is extended till Hridai Kunj, this makes the Hridai Kunj isolate from its contest because of the way it's accessed in the ashram. In the past, when there was diffusion between the built and its environment, it engendered a common practice, a common ground, and materialized a philosophy of practice. But currently, when built structures are having strong territories, it, it's symbolizing spaces and creating separation from the common ground. 
we look into the memorial in relationship to the philosophies of the ashram, in Hridaya Kunj, the most private spaces are also opened up from all the four sides, connecting to the open spaces, because those spaces being spaces for communal activities. Whereas in the memorial museum, the courtyards created are uh, packed with urban uh, structures and, and become mere boxes to access. Um, materials used in construction systems in relation to the specific context, the form not being true to its materials, wooden cladding in roof structure, hiding all the structural members and visual aesthetics being the sole reason. Whereas build, rest of the buildings on site are being true to the materials used. And adapting a modular structure and having same building fenestrations on all four sides does not take care of the light and heat gain inside the building. And the shallow water body in the center is being treated as a visual object. Considering the climate of Ahmedabad, the best way to deal with water is to hide it and preserve it. Uh, when looked at the ashram as a whole versus a whole entity vis-a-vis -vis ashram as a territory of activities, galleries consisting of artifacts and history occupy the largest site on the site. Whereas Gandhiji was all be, uh, is all about practice. Instead, the function could have repurposed within the iconic buildings on site. And uh, admin located in one corner does not make functional feasibility with the context. Uh, library block and archives building located very far from each other does not make sense because of their close programmatic relationships. And toilets just remained as a functional amenities and missed the opportunity of being social infrastructure. The programs in the museum are isolated from its own context and tries to stand alone. And because of museumification, the activities that held the ashram alive are dead. Hence, makes it a place of frozen history. And the site also has rigid boundaries, lacking an interface with the ashram spread in the vicinity and the edge towards the river. Hence, making the ashram self-referential. What could have been better is to recognize larger relationships beyond the site plot also the people and the philosophy it's built for would, make, would have made it more appropriate for the very specific context. As a concluding note, we would like to define architectural quality through a set of relationships. Architect's philosophy and its manifestation. And its manifestation. As a case of Gandhi Ashram, Korea missed the opportunity of interpreting and integrating Gandhi's philosophy for the ashram and the city at large. The building and its context, in case of Gandhi Ashram, Korea considered the north empty corner as a site plot, whereas the actual site is spread across both sides of the Ashram road. The program and the building. In case of number 11, the building has, has got to do little with the program. Multiple recurring programmatic spaces and leftover unusable spaces prove this. And in case of Gandhi Ashram, the program was merely restricted to exhibition. The inhabitants and the building. Number 11 was never looked at through the servant's lens, the servant being the pertinent inhabitant of the house. And the drawing and the building. What shows in the drawing is sometimes not seen in the building, and what's not shown in the drawing is sometimes seen in the building. Yeah. Thank you. Carlos, you need to, yeah. Yes, 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 I did say. So. Oh, any questions or comments? Well, I do have some. Uh, I think that, uh, I think that we all agree that it is in a hypertrophy of visuality in most, uh, uh, criticism of architecture and um, even in uh, whether in um, schools or uh, in real life. But uh, I have the feeling that you somehow overstated it because actually the idea of architecture as a multisensorial experience is, uh, is not a new one. You know? So uh, I have not really caught uh, how the examples 
uh, you criticize in your presentation have to do with this um, multisensoriality of architecture. Could you elaborate on that? Could you answer that? Our presentation was not specifically addressing a multisensoriality mm -hmm. per se. Uh, we were mm -hmm. more concerned with how uh, specific uh, problems or specific uh, architectural problems demand specific solutions rather than generic. Uh, suppose, for for example, the 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 servants' uh, room in the in number eleven. Uh, the, the particular case in which that could have been dealt with to connect to the axis for circulation was very specific, and uh, to to bring out a generic uh, uh, solution such as uh, the an addition of a door uh, would, would would have not made much sense. Uh, similarly, in the case of Gandhi Ashram, uh, since the the project was at a larger scale and. Uh, uh, philosophically at a level because Gandhi is the person who has influenced the whole nation. Uh, the way it's the ashram itself was treated uh, and uh, assumed to be a mere exhibition of historic facts and not a, 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 a practiced uh, every day, a living memorial was what we were kind of questioning. I hope I was able to answer your question. Ana Tostois has a question. Oh, yes. yes. Hello, Fernando. Hello, Carlos. Hello, hello, uh, hello Wilfried. Um, I, I would like to, to ask Douglas because I wished so much to, um, to learn what he had to tell us, but um, things went not so well. and and you had not enough time um and and the point uh, or one of the points is of course it's 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 very interesting and and in a way very clear even if it was too short um the the analysis you made between the guggenheim and the Ibere Camargo and the path of uh, um frank lloyd wright and and caesar um and, and uh, uh, I would like first just to ask, and perhaps you could chat me, uh, if you have your, your paper or your conference already published, because I, I wished very much to, to read it um, calmly. Um, and, and, and the other question is, as let's say we know, or some of us uh, sustain, and I, I, I believe, William Curtis agrees on that. Caesar uh, works very much on, uh, let's say, architectural culture all times, uh, but mainly 20th century. Um, and it's very um, curious or uh, very stimulating to, to see when he's quoting more a little bit Frank Lloyd Wright, I would say, save first time uh, in the swimming pools of Lesa de Palmeira with all these, uh, uh, let's say, plans and, and, and the way of the, 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 the walking uh, path. It's in fact very, very, very important. But my question concerning the Ibera Camargo and the Guggenheim uh, is uh, if you consider or if you have already um, analyzed some uh, connections with the uh, Lina Bobardi, Sesc Pompeia, the bridge uh, systems. I always think that Caesar mixed, you know, a little bit of Nimaya, a little bit of Lin, and a little bit of Guggenheim, and then um, he's Caesar uh, 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 always. And Iberia Camargo, we, we all know it's a, um, a quite successful process. There are some that were not so good. In fact, there was a great commitment from the commissioner, the, the people working in the um, in the construction, and 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 there there was money as well, and so things went quite well. So, Douglas, can you tell us just a little bit more, and then we keep for uh, <laughs> another another occasion to have more time to discuss. 
Thank you very much for your question, Anna. Um, well, this uh, concept of uh, spatial performance, I think it's uh, it it is a sort of um, ambitious uh, concept, and I think it is more applied to common architecture, current architecture. Uh, that architecture that can either make your life better or sometimes it, uh, it, make, it has a bad effect on, on life, you see. When it comes to uh, masterpieces, and when you talk about Caesar's Museum in Porto Alegre and uh, in, in, in Guggenheim Museum in New York. And I took these buildings deliberately because it, it, the, the, the issue of uh, uh, architectural quality becomes quite ambiguous there. Because uh, um, Wright, he produced a sort of obvious building where space is uh, uh, brings about a sort of congregation of people. So you have the pleasure of the company of people there. In the, you see the exhibitions, you look at the void and you have a sort of effervescent uh, uh, situation. In, in the Museum Iberê Camargo, sees a place permanently with disconnection. You, you, you can hide uh, different times. And even the void is, is, is put in a position and the, um, the way it related to, to the exhibitions, the width of the, the, the how do you call the, the, not the rails, but if it, uh, so you have uh, a sort of uh, Caesar playing, playing with irony. Uh, he, the, the access to the tubular uh, pathways, it, it's hard to find. So it, 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 it's all, all the time Caesar is, is producing a sort of giant installation that brings surprise. And, 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 and uh, right? It's a very well-behaved building. It's a common building, you see? And so Caesar is a fantastic artist and, and he did something there that is um, a quite unexpected. But if you are talking about architectural quality in terms of the way buildings deal with people, uh, right? Uh, it gives a lecture because he people uh, aggregate people uh, rights building while uh, Caesar's building it says very complex and, uh, and I think in, in, the, in the case of this sort of program museums uh, the success or the failure of a building is very much related to this to this capacity of receiving people and making people feel uh, well and the sort of thing. And, and from this point of view, even if I have to agree from the standpoint of the work of art, I think Caesar produced something fantastic. From the standpoint of architecture understood as a, as a social art, as a social thing, uh, uh, the building is not good. So I, I, I know I'm, I'm daring <laughs> say that because I, I, I listened to, to William and it's quite likely that William have, has a different opinion and I'm quite ready to, to understand it. But this is my, my impression, Anna. Okay. Yeah. So you, you think that let's say common people um, is well are well received in the Guggenheim in New York and in Ibera Camargo, it's a more complex uh, experience and so people avoid things. So it's the same with the um, education of architects. If we, we 
put our focus in the best or we put our focus in all the students. It's this mass uh, Ortega Gassi problem. Well, uh, you see, uh, Andrea, the girl that did this uh, the master's dissertation on, on this subject, he said that children enjoy a lot the tubular walkways okay. of the Ibere Camargo and, and they go up and down and look okay. at the hatches. And so, so it's, a, it's a complex situation. Well, if you think about the concept of spatial performance in terms of uh, housing, for instance, it's a, a sort of uh, fantastic how you see bad architecture from the point of view of spatial performance in current architecture, housing, uh, apartment buildings. And uh, so I, 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 when I wrote this, and I deal very much with, at the university with um, uh, teaching people and discussing students' projects, I use very much this concept in terms for people to understand how architecture, uh, especially common spaces, housing spaces, they must deal uh, in a decent way with people. It, and it doesn't happen very often, you see. So this is my main, my main proposition. Thank you, Douglas. I thank you very much, Anna. Is there another question? Wilfred, Wilfred, raise his hand. Wilfred then Yazd. Wilfred? Thank you, um, Fernando. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, common to both presentations is an interest in uh, the syntax and the uh, composition of the spaces. And um, I think it's quite daring uh, for uh, young people to take on uh, the canons, the, the masterpieces, so-called, and to redesign them. I think that's uh, a form of uh, constructive criticism, which I, uh, is based on a close reading or close analysis of these buildings. So I, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, Vishnu and ha uh, Hamsika for this approach. However, if it's to do with uh, the notion of architectural quality, I think what you need to be clearer about is how uh, you present a lens, you present an approach, you have a position, and how that position is, uh, should be made more explicit, because uh, the interest of uh, uh, an architect's interest, especially is in, his, in the design of his own house, in um, being uh, sort of... Uh, uh, respectful of the servants uh, is probably not the most important uh, notion, especially, uh, you know, in the 1960s and 70s and so on, when um, servants were servants and they were not to be seen, right? So uh, I think you have a different lens, you have a different approach, and I think that needs to be made explicit. Um, in the case of uh, the, uh, the Gandhi project, uh, I think it's a very interesting analysis too, and uh, there is not so much a, a redesign of the shrine, but a kind of a critique of uh, what has happened to it. Uh, and it's inevitable that places like that, when they have been used as domestic uh, environment, and when they were very open, that because of their uh, symbolic and national and cultural significance, uh, they become removed, they become uh, literally segregated from the rest of uh, the physical fabric. So that's also something that one has to uh, acknowledge as a logical conclusion of the elevation to a, um, a publicly significant object, right? And uh, I think that the critique that this has become uh, removed um, has to be seen in that context. So I'm, I'm relativizing the, the process, even though I understand the critique. Um, and in regards to uh, Douglas' presentation, I wish you could have saved all that stuff uh, about uh, Schmalzo and uh, and uh, when, if you had gone straight to what you just uh, answered to Anna, and uh, because it's a lot clearer, <coughs> in the end, 
it's a much more it's a much more valuable insight in in uh, how you see these things differentiated <laughs> between uh, you know uh, because you know I I studied under Bill Hillier and uh, uh, um, and space syntax and I've always been very critical of the lack of the, uh, of insight that space syntax has in terms of understanding architecture. But I think you, uh, in, in your last answer, have showed that you do have a, a, a way of understanding architecture and you do have a way of speaking about it. So I, I'm, I'm much relieved that uh, that is the case. Um, before okay, thank you. going to the so, Atlantic. So let, let, uh, that was a comment, not, not a question. Yeah, Sorry. Yes. Be, be, before going to the round table, no, but uh, Yasna has asked it. Yasna is waiting, yeah. Fernando. I'm wondering if we Sorry. have still some time for the questions or if if we should move to the round table, perhaps I would not like to. to... Uh, I think that uh, okay. we have the time. So just a briefly, I my interest is uh, focused on the functional aspect of particularly Guggenheim Museum. Uh, the, the building was much criticized from uh, the circles of, uh, you know, museum people uh, that it is too performative and it is not user friendly when you are trying to to make the exhibition there. That's that was uh, one point. And the, the second, well, I would like to to hear your opinion or comment uh, from the point of this predetermined pathway. So if we, could, if we put it in the con context of uh, uh, Mitchell's analysis on, on Sol Steinberg's meta pictures and this spiral as a, as a form that we have to follow, or when you see the, the exhibition of On Cavara, retrospective exhibition that was displayed there. So could you, could you perhaps tell us more precisely um, what is your your opinion about it is it the, the real quality of this of this museum from this point of view or could we um, or could we perhaps have more critical comments on that thank you thank you thank you jasna for your question and it's very interesting because i agree entirely that these both buildings because both these buildings have in common this one pathway building. They are both uh, this way uh, conceived as that. And I agree entirely that from the standpoint of exhibitions, let's say if you go to the National Gallery in London, so you have a variety of ways you can go throughout the building. So you have uh, uh, loads of spatial rings, let's say, where you, you can go around. So these buildings have this in common. And I agree entirely that uh, in the case of the Guggenheim, it is even more repetitive because the exhibition spaces are around the, the void. They have all the same, same shape while it, uh, for Caesar, you have different types and you, you in the one at the corner that is it's a very little connection with the void is more segregated so you have more variety in in the case of um, in the case of seas in terms of, of the exhibition spaces but what i try to say is that today i have this impression that museums today they are very much meeting places. People go there to, to meet and to go around, like a public space, you see. So it's something of our time. And the concept of, of museum, I think, has changed. And from this standpoint, uh, the Guggenheim is fantastic because you go there and you have that sort of uh, um, happening. Uh, go, uh, going on, you see. While in the, the in the case of Caesar uh, in Porto Alegre, it's it, it's a, a more difficult building. It, it hides things. It hides uh, entrance doors. It hides the lifts. 
And it's very much on purpose because Caesar is not doing, doing this by accident. It, he is playing with, with people, you see. So this is what I find fantastic in architecture. And the, the reason we are here, because we are very much fascinated by architecture and the subject of architectural quality is, is really ambiguous. And the reason I, 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 I brought this comparison is very much because of that, you see. So um, difficult to difficult to to answer your question, you see. But I think we have. Uh, thank you very much. But we have to to have a deep uh, reflection about this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much as well. Carlos Eduardo. Yes, William. Unmute yourself. Yeah, okay. Um, well, thank you for, for both of these presentations, which I found very interesting and which are uh, regarding buildings which, uh, you know, have been uh, in certain ways important uh, to me. But <clears throat> I wanted to carry on with the discussion about the, first of all, the, the two museums. Um, I was recently back in Porto, but also in Santiago de Compostela very recently. And one of the things that struck me about um, Caesar's orchestration of, of sequence uh, is how uh, important um, visual clues are about where you go, um, how important the floor is, the body, the steps. Uh, I had the chance to go to the swimming pool that's in the Tavara um, Park for the first time. It's always been closed. And the whole action of going swimming and even the ritual of wiping your feet, moving, going through a pool, discovering this floating plane of water. It's totally uh, extraordinary and absorbing uh, the ease with which people occupy the terraces and the way that it's integrated and so forth. Whereas the other swimming pool is very much about the horizon as is his early restaurant uh, in the sense that the horizon is the destination and then it's denied you and you rediscover it and so forth. The Central Gallego, um, <clears throat> what strikes me about it, in contrast, probably, I don't know the building in Brazil yet, has a wonderful uh, aspect of layers that you come into the lobby and feel it's part of the city. You gradually filter into a series of different spaces with different degrees of enclosure and intimacy, but there's plenty of time to, com to contemplate in the transitions. Neither, as far as I can see, the Guggenheim or the other building have this feeling of transitions unless possibly in the uh, Caesar building going around the tubes is when you disconnect for a bit and then come back. But Gu Guggenheim, I actually have to find, say that I, I don't find this a great quality having this sense of being all part of a public space. What's lacking is meditative space. And frankly, it's very disturbing to always be on a slope and to have the works of art also sloping away from you. There's no pause, you're constantly on the, on the move. Um, space, fair enough, but I think materi materially, it's not a very successful building. It, it, it leaves you very uncertain what it's made of. Uh, it's uncomfortable even, to the point that some people caricature it as a piece of kitchen equipment. Uh, uh, it doesn't have that wonderful materiality of his little jewelry shop, for example, in San Francisco. So I think the, the space is okay, but I mean, there are all these other dimensions which need to be discussed and how, how well uh, can you really exhibit things in either of these buildings? Um, I, I simply, it's a question. I don't understand how you put anything in Caesar's building. And um, I do understand in Guggenheim because I've seen many exhibitions that were actually a little bit uncomfortable in that building. So let's put the question directly. How, how well does the Brazilian building serve its function? Very well. And uh, I think that the first point to make is that the ramps in Caesar's building are not for exhibition. They are kind of the compression spaces um, and there are moments and they're exactly as you hinted at, you know, this is where you get out of yeah. the exhibition space and you have glimpses of the uh, city and uh, the river and the, the hill. So yeah. actually, one thing that has to <clears throat> immediately uh, uh, considered when comparing the two buildings is that the situation of uh, the building sites are very different. Mm -hmm. New York, Guggenheim, you know, is a 
Fifth Avenue, okay? It's uh, in, amidst, you know, the grid, and it's part of the city. Actually, Caesar occupies a very uh, difficult piece of terrain, which is a slice of a quarry, and it's bordered by a fast traffic uh, avenue. And yeah. it's a kind of a hinge between, uh, uh, it, it's, it sits in, amidst a Tehran Vag that buffers it from the downtown on one side and from the suburbs, uh, from the southern suburbs to the other. Uh, so yeah. it's a kind of crossroads. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to find a, a way of getting into it. And uh, uh, the only way they could solve the question of parking or uh, vehicular servicing was getting into, into a partnership with the, uh, with the municipality so that uh, the parking is beneath <coughs> the avenue itself. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. And it's a very, as a masterful uh, orchestration, both mm -hmm. of spaces and uh, um, of and different kinds, okay? Yeah. And also, yeah, I, I think that one of the uh, remarkable things about the building is the way Caesar, uh, Caesar's party, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's a tower from one point of view, and it's a, a wing from another point of view. So that actually, he uh, remakes a kind of uh, he spreads the building so that actually it's a block size uh, entity that actually incorporates, integrates into the urban composition of a lonely and very ugly apartment building nearby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, so so, and also, you um, also have this, this uh, working with transparency. Actually, I think that it's one of the most transparent Caesar buildings I've known. Uh, only that the transparency is not really about, you know, uh, window walls or, uh, no. uh, but it's also, it's about uh, getting, you know, windows uh, uh, enfilade, uh, with other uh, windows uh, in uh, enfilade so that you can, from the uh, avenue, you can get through and see the uh, green hill that is beside the building. And it's an orchestration that gets its maximum point at this open air atrium. And then you get into the tower itself, which is actually, uh, 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 an enclosed but uh, tall atrium, which gives you the opportunity of getting into the ramps or taking an elevator. So there is many more possibilities uh, for uh, walking and for, uh, you know, uh, many more possibilities for uh, your deambulation than what you get at the Guggenheim. And mm -hmm. spaces for circulation are clearly disconnected from the galleries themselves. Very good, that's helpful. Can I just make one brief rapid observation? Coming back to Bobadi and the observation, that I think that's absolutely right. I think he has an uncanny radar, um, Caesar, for picking up on relevant precedents and leaving them sotto voce in his, in his buildings. And years ago, when I did an El Croquis on him, we were talking about his pavilion you know, in, in Lisbon. And uh, his evocation of the Plaza Corbieta of Villanueva, um, which is not direct, but this, he's yeah. of all European architects, he's a person with the most dense culture of Latin American architecture, dense in the sense of very uh, profound experiences, which are part of his memory bank and which m sort of float in and out of his uh, imagination. So it doesn't surprise me in the least uh, that some of those qualities emerge again in, in a building which is after all in, in Brazil. Anyway, I have to go and see it. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I, I would like to, to, to remind that these both museums are in, in belong to the type of the vertical museum. Uh, I have just visited one, uh, which is the Munch Museum recently finished in Oslo. Uh, but uh, uh, 
but to say something more about uh, the, the, the Iberia Camargo, uh, it, it is interesting to see that you can, he makes you, he allows you to change uh, 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 your environment before changing uh, the, uh, to a different floor. So it's like a sommelier that, uh, uh, that cleans his mouth and he can go to another, uh, 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 another exhibition in another floor with a fresh eye. Mm. So it's interesting to see that this, this, uh, this, um, this change of environment, which is completely uh, intense, intense is, it has a purpose. It, has mm. a, it, it, is, it, it makes sense to, to go outside of, of the, this big public space and then re-enter in another floor to uh, 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 another arrangement of, of works of arts. Is the material snow crete? Is it a, a white concrete integral or is it painted <laughs> in any way? That is pretty tricky because it's concrete in the outside, but it's, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, this uh, rock, uh, uh, Hardboard in the inside. Ah, plasterboard. Plasterboard. Yeah, plasterboard. Yes, because yeah. you need yeah. the isolation, uh, yeah. and because he wanted to the museum to be seen as as pure concrete, he needed to put the isolation on the inside, which is not very yeah. rational. Right. Okay. I don't think that he wants to to the, the, the building to be seen with the same texture outside and inside. The walls are 40 centimeters thick, and uh, it's not only about insulation. It's also about about the uh, all the ducts and all the cables and the wires, you know, getting in these interstices between the concrete wall and the plasterboard inside. So you have a play with uh, a kind of more um, rough texture uh, outside and a very smooth, you know white surface uh, inside. I think the other thing that always um, uh, pleases me when I go there is that this is a kind of what I call a, a silent uh, space in the sense that you don't see any ducts, you, you don't see any wires, you don't see any cables, you don't see any lighting tracks, you know. Light, uh, lighting is, uh, is solved with uh, uh, a kind of the, the ceilings being a sort of uh, uh, a chandelier. It's very reminiscent, you know, of those uh, uh, um, translucent Art Deco ceilings, you know, and you don't see any air conditioning grills, you know, it's just, you know, slots uh, on the uh, next to the floor or next to the ceiling. So it's a, a quite calm in, interior. Wilfred? Actually, there are two um, comments, one from Anna and the other from Kevin. Yes, Anna? Uh, unmute yourself, Anna, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just wondering, because this large theme on quality of architecture, I, I, I found it's, ve it's very interesting if we really analyze museums and, and, and I was just thinking on some of the four museums of Sisa and the sequence of the museum. So Santiago, um, from which uh, William Curtis has um, already mentioned, then Serralves in Porto, Iberia Camargo is an incredible explosion. And, and I would say finally, the South Korea, my Mimesis or my message museum, it's, it's amazing because it's not anymore the tower but um, it, 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 this kind of uh, um, place provoking pleasure to walking and, and, and admiring and, 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 and let uh, ourselves, our bodies and our minds going through uh, the space and the museum and so on. It's really uh, incredible 
uh, how what you were talking about orchestration of space is done in the Korean um, situation, which is a completely other one. It's a plea, you know, this, this, this Caesar things when he's making this. So uh, I don't know, it's the French uh, word, plea, the plié. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry? A fold, plea. Yes, yes. So it's a fold. You have this in the pavilion, Carlos Ramos, you have in lots of uh, um, systems. And then I was going back to what uh, uh, Carlos Eduardo Comas very, I would say, intelligently uh, um, brought to the discussion before, which was Kubler. Uh, not only Carlos, but uh, uh, Kubler was was mentioned with the idea of uh, series and and repetition and the top of series. So this is a I'm, I have not an answer. This is just a, a contribution for the 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 discussion. But I think this is a really really very uh, rich uh, issue to to follow. Uh, I, I would say. I mean the space museums, all these um amazing uh, spaces to go through uh, for pub uh, 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 with a public purpose it's it's really uh, incredible with these uh, shifts of uh, um, scales some colossal scales sometimes and then very lily put ones it's it's amazing mm. okay thank you Anna. thank you kevin can you unmute yourself Yes, I am unmuted. Thank you so much for. Uh, um, if, <laughs> I, I, I've got a bit of a reputation for being contentious, so please, all in good spirit here. Am I the only one to note that in the last 15 minutes, all we've been talking about has been aesthetics, which is not about critical architecture? I mean, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? We've been waxing on and on about how amazing volumes are how we deal with the transition of spaces, how arrangements go on, but none of that is critical because it's all about aesthetics. And you like pink and I like blue, or you like polka dots and I like pinstripes, and who's right and who's wrong? It's a silly question. I mean, we're not talking about issues that really matter in architecture, are we? I'm so sorry. No, uh, I, think, I don't mean to come across. <laughs> I think, Kevin, you're, you're quite wrong because I think these aesthetic issues are as important as any other issues. And I think they of have. Of course they are, Wilfred. <laughs> they are important. But well, when they, they, when they occupy the, the entire. But when, they occupy, but when they occupy the entire discussion, we are missing out on a very, very important other half because architecture isn't merely about form. And that's what we've, we've gone on for decades already missing out on content on critical content hey, so hey, this hey. is very disturbing to hey, me hey. because the equation hey, hasn't hey, changed hey, hey, hey. did you listen to my presentation yes i did so, William. Well, really well, and not, and not much here. has changed over the decades we're still a bunch of we're still a bunch of academics uh, critiquing aesthetics and it's not changed in 50 years it's very disturbing and then we, 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 we want to present, uh, bring up a new range of young people to take the, uh, the, the, the torch, but it's not really happening. It's aesthetics is important, but we can't keep on focusing on it for the rest of our lives. Well, I I'm so can, sorry. Well, so, so, I, I mean, I have to say that uh, if I unpeel what I read out for 40 minutes, it, uh, only about uh, 10 minutes was to do with aesthetics. It was a great deal to do with cultural substance, symbolization, ideology, construction, material, this, that, the other thing, and history. So I'm not sure, you know, what you... If from, the lens, but from the lens of aesthetics, you see, William, look, even, even Wilfred's comment about Oh, you know, back in the 60s, servants were out of sight, out of mind. Oh, right, that excuses the way human beings behave? Right, back in the Middle Ages, it was about the might, about the feudal lords. And if you had a bigger army, you, you had your right. It doesn't make that right. You well, know no, what no, I mean? No, I, I'm with you, but I mean, I just you know, don't wish to be misportrayed, but I have a whole chunk in there about the problems of extreme urbanization, what that's doing to societies, 
um, about the plutocracy and what the, the mess that that's creating in the world. I mean, all of that's in there. It's not just about aesthetics, uh, Kevin. But I mean, I understand your 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 commitment, but uh, I don't I don't feel the need. I mean, when we deal with architecture, it seems to me we have to try and develop an integrated model that ca carries several things together: uh, and uh, aesthetics, uh, symbolism, materiality, purpose. Um, you know, wealth. This, that, the other. They, they all come into it. I agree, but. Uh, what, what would you prefer the emphasis to be? Because obviously you're annoyed about the emphasis. About human beings. I mean, we, we talk an all in all about tearing down walls and boundaries between people. And yet we only focus on the things that uh, we and other uh, um, um, people who are in, in, in positions of privilege and entitlement will appreciate having to do with aesthetics. We, we don't yeah. care. You know, look. Look, it's an interesting thing that that um, that um, Lu Khan, Lu Khan, uh, rightly brought layering and and the differentiation between services. Sorry. Oh, okay. No, it's it's all right. Um, and 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 he 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 gave names to served and servant spaces. Not yes. that it's a bad thing. But it created a whole distinction between how we design servant spaces. Because if it is for use for servants and if it's for service, it will be designed in a lesser way than the elevated spaces that are for the so-called users. Now, the interesting thing is, what, what defines a user? My, 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 my a compatriot in Singapore was shocked when he realized that the biggest user of his apartment was his maid because she's there 24 seven, six days a week. And how many apartments in the world are designed for servants? They're not because we don't think they're users. And so we, we keep on perpetuating these boundaries between people, you see, rather than tearing them down. Uh, the entitled and privilege okay, still uh, win uh, the war. Kevin, I'm afraid, I'm afraid that, that uh, everything is aesthetic. So uh, in a world where communication is dominant, everything comes through the eye. And even if you want to avoid it, uh, you, have to, you have to confront it. So I gave a, a, a lecture on the um, environmental consequences of aesthetic decisions. And, and you can discuss that, but you can't avoid aesthetics because aesthetic is Communication. I'm not. A, I'm not trying to avoid aesthetics, Fernando. I'm just trying to ask us to not have the conversation revolve around aesthetics predominantly because it's a silly thing. We should be talking about Wilfred. whether. You, sorry. Wilfred. Like just just as another example, Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water has been lauded as this wonderful new examination between man and environment. Now it's a crazy thing because it's rarely ever discussed. When you build a, a, an umbrella, basically a cantilever over a, a, anything that's living, over a tree, over grass, grass, nothing lives under shade. So everything under that cantilever that Frank Lloyd Wright did doesn't live. Nothing lives oh. in that stream because shade, both. the lack of uh, sunlight kills. So we use words as architects, as critics, to, to hide uh, um, deficiencies in our icons. And it's wrong, you see? And, and all the thing, everything that Frank Lloyd Wright did with Folly Water was to create this wonderful horizontality in a forest of verticality. It, it, it implied a con an aesthetic connection to nature without addressing nature at all. In fact, uh, uh, removing a, a, a closer <coughs> connection to nature. You understand? So what, 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 what I have a problem with is architectural criticism not necessarily taking the 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 upper the upper uh, um, um, the higher ground of what critique could be about and well, focusing uh, on Kevin, aesthetics making okay. aesthetics you made, the, the main issue. Kevin, <laughs> you made it clear you already made it clear Kevin. Okay. We, okay. We forward. <laughs> Kevin, okay. I, thank you. I. I, I I very much appreciate your um, position, and of course, uh, we, many of us, share um, your concern. The thing is, what I what I was trying to say was, 
it's all very well to have the lenses uh, that we have today with uh, an interest in social equity, um, but it would be misunderstanding the uh, the main intentions of those days in the 1970s and so on, even, uh, even um, uh, Louis Kahn's concerns, um, to use these lenses as the way uh, of objectively trying to assess uh, the quality of, of the design as it was intended then, right? So that there is something about trying to understand uh, the conditions under which uh, a piece of architecture was designed at one stage and trying to be as close uh, to that as possible, while on the other hand, not excluding the, the legitimacy of the point of view that we have today, right? So these two things are, I, I think, need to be separate, separated and differentiated. Where you stand as an individual is your decision. But I think you can't just say and condemn, you know, uh, the, the the palaces of Versailles and uh, Louis Kahn and so on, because they condemn servants to uh, uh, exist in, in, you know, to be troglodytes. I think that doesn't make sense. You you have to understand that they were mistreated, and that they uh, that there were these interstitial spaces in Versailles and other palaces um, for that explicit reason, right? So no, you see, Wilfred, uh, Wilfred, the problem is they continue to be mistreated nothing yeah, has no, changed I'm, 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 I'm not saying <laughs> that there is uh, there are social problems uh, around the world because right? 50 not, years not... from now 100 years from now they'll look back at today and go oh my god did these no, guys not understand they, what was uh, happening no they will they will look back at because it's still about they... the haves and have nots and architecture hasn't taken any steps towards Making rights, making a, a right out of a wrong. You see. No, I, I think well, that that's anyway. Can can I just add something? See, I think that one could do. I mean, I'd be very happy to do it. Uh, um, a totally different talk, um, critiquing Dubai, um, including the the dark side and how it's built, and say above all, criticizing um, the um, iconization of football in Qatar at the moment. Um, which is a pure portrait of the inequalities of our time, of a stinking plutocracy, uh, of uh, an in fact a dictatorship, and of horrendous exploitation of third world labor. I'd be perfectly happy to do it, and along the way talk about the relative value or not of uh, Jean Nouvel's uh, Tiki Tac Tiki Tac Museum, which doesn't have much in it yet. I mean, or, uh, these are all different things one can be doing, and I'm uh, actually happy to do them and, and, and involved in what's called ideological criticism, not the Tafuri kind, but a kind that really digs in to the power structures, the inequalities, and the delusions that are generated by architecture, often to cover uh, the, the difficulties, which may be one of the things that interests you. But I mean, I don't, I don't think you should um, accuse us of all being on one line or something. I mean, I think we're all investigating different things and could do this in a different way too, if need be. May I say uh, William, a word, of, a word of respect, sorry, just a word of respect for our, okay. our colleagues from India. Ahmedabad is one of my spiritual homes. Um, and uh, so I was very pleased that you talked about the uh, Gandhi ashram uh, museum, which um, has a wonderful quality of having taken ideas from Khan and here and there and Corbusier, but made this mellifluous, very beautiful interflowing space. And my experience of it is that it's very open to the public and people like hanging around. The problem is the way it's being appropriated now by the Hindu fundamentalist government uh, to, you know, in, in other words, undermine Gandhi's message. That's the real issue of the moment uh, that, that's going on, just as it is across India, which is the, the attack on secular modernism. The destruction of the Hall of Nations building three years ago of Raj Rewal is a straight attack on, Ner on Nehru's philosophy and on uh, the secular definition of India. Now, this is kind of rich poison, if you want, uh, Kevin, we could be really getting into. So that building, which is so beautiful and did a beautiful portrait in a way of the humility of Gandhi, is under threat of being re-signified uh, by uh, the, the uh, extremist uh, Hindu nationalists in, in control in India at the moment. I mean, and so one can go on and on. But the, the fight I've got into in protecting the, um, uh, you know, let's say, uh, modern heritage in India has been absolutely direct politically. I have attacked the Modi government in the Indi Indian press, um, have attacked the 
uh, real estate and international, including American interests, uh, which are wrecking modern architectural patronage. Now, does that make you happier? <laughs> Will you his hand? Hey, may I answer? Yeah. May I answer? Uh, yes, sorry. of course. Will you raise his oh, hand? Uh, go ahead, uh, Kevin. Uh, you see, uh, I, I feel Dubai would be a waste of, of your of your of your efforts, uh, you know, I William, because it's easy. It's easy to criticize that. I think it's what criticism should be about, about the very best works of an architect, ah, not the okay. very worst. So Dubai would be would be a, would be a, a, a no brainer. Yes. So why don't we take on the best works done by Peter Zumto? Why don't we take on the best works done by uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, Herzog and Muran? Uh, um, and, and, and critique those, you see. So I, well, I believe that, yeah, so. Yes, and, and, well, let's, and, let's take and, and the Gandhi And the Gandhi Ashram, and the Gandhi Ashram, however beautiful it was aesthetically, aesthetically, it failed to understand what the ashram was created for to begin with, and it just became an exhibition hall. And, and if that's fine, if that's the level of critique we want to uh, uh, subject architecture to, but it's not enough, is it? Because architecture critique has to be about depth, has to be about critical content, not just about beautiful form that expresses the humility of Gandhi. Because if Gandhi had a say, he wouldn't even have wanted a memorial in his name. Well, <laughs> another <laughs> argument, but memorials are not just for the person, they're actually for the society and they help to create its, its, its future. But let's take Zumtor. I mean, Zumtor intrigues me for um, his uh, obfuscation uh, of, what he, of what he's doing, and he's got away with it um, a, a great deal, and, and uh, 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 using words like atmosphere and, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Now, he's in deep, deep trouble in Los Angeles with the project for the museum, where his whole methodology simply doesn't work for a building of that scale. Uh, and he's creating a museum which is absolutely unusable, that's uh, uh, an absolute scandal economically. This is the Los Angeles County Museum thing. And it all, oh, I was interested in the fact that there was black oil there and this blob led me to this shape. Stop, look at it and let's pull this apart. So there's a very interesting case of um, a sort of phenomenological blah, blah, blah of architecture being used to dis defend the indefensible. Similarly, Stephen Hall, when he did that awful building in front of, of Macintosh's building before poor old Macintosh burned down, uh, uses all these, you know, theor theory is used as a smokescreen. And, and I think that, you know, the, the ar architectural criticism has to weigh up the, po the pros and the cons. I happen to be very admiring of the very early works of Zumtor and far less admiring of these hugely self-conscious exercises in experience. You know, I think he was much better when he did his wooden chapel, which is very experienced. But, you know, th these are all part of the dangers of our time, the temptations, the reputations. And of course, we did have a, a go at the Pritzker Prize. The Pritzker Prize nearly always uh, produces worse architecture afterwards, after they've won it, you know. It's too much for people to, to take well, this. Well, yes. we have to acknowledge uh, <laughs> with that um, 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 the Australian uh, winner prize, uh, what, um, I'm sorry, um, would you help me with the um, Australian Pritzker? Glenn Merkert. But we, ha we have to acknowledge that Glenn Market, uh, he uh, he was pretty aware that he shouldn't build big buildings oh, because yeah. his method was uh, art artisanal, uh, art craft a craft a, a craftsman. So he he is it is interesting that that uh, Zumto didn't realize he he he's a craftsman and not a <laughs> big building. Absolutely. Awesome. He's out of scale. He doesn't know how to do a big building. And speaking of, of, uh, of Merkert, when <laughs> Merkert was present, well, very briefly, uh, sorry, Wilfred. Uh, Merkert, when he was the president of the Pritzker jury, um, he told me, William, you'll be very happy because we chose RCR, Aranda, Pigeon, Villalta, and, and we chose Doshi. And I said, well, chapeau. So, you know, so, sometimes the key people in a jury, and they were doing that deliberately to get away from, you know, excessive star architecture towards a more restrained, culturally based, or whatever you like to, like to call it. So such are the, uh, you know, variations of opinion. But anyway, back to Wilfred. <laughs> 
Well, thank you, uh, William. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, I want to come back to uh, the two colleagues uh, from India, Vishnu and Hamsika, because uh, they did exactly what uh, Kevin has asked. Uh, they, they did an analysis of uh, these two projects on the um, social and uh, the, the, the significance of servants. And so uh, I think they're opening up a, a debate, uh, which indeed is something that can be carried forward if criticism is an explicit evaluation of architectural quality. Then the interesting thing is, as uh, Vishnu was proposing in his redesign of the Bawa uh, house, uh, redesign is a form of explicit criticism of the house. So architectural design, whether in its initial form or in the redesign of something, it can be a form of criticism as well. And I think that that is something uh, Trent and I were discussing earlier on um, before the conference that maybe uh, one of the topics uh, for perhaps another session uh, next year or so could be architecture as criticism. So um, how does a work in itself uh, substantiate criticism? Is critical of certain conditions, of certain social and environmental issues? And how does it make that explicit? How is it read or read? Well, how, how is it intelligible? Uh, to, 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 to move in that direction, which I found pretty interesting, redesign as a way of criticism, we ha you have to fight with the sacralization of the author. Well, I think that Caesar is a way, is a criticism of, uh, uh, of Guggenheim, you know, is, is obvious. <laughs> so, it's 12.30 in uh, our time. Do you think it's time to call quits? I would like to thank uh, uh, Carlos and Fernando for uh, moderating this session. Uh, it's not been all that easy, but uh, thank you for the very uh, uh, committed comments, uh, um, everyone. And thank you for the wonderful papers. I think that they were insightful and uh, full of uh, uh, good suggestions, uh, good uh, uh, content. And uh, we will uh, we will re uh, reconnect uh, if you like next Saturday and uh, the following Sunday for sessions three and four using the same Zoom connection. Uh, so Could I I'm... very briefly interject? Yeah, Trent. Sorry, I just wanted to point out that I just made a comment that I realize is exactly repeating what she said. But our colleague from our last conference, Berna Goal, made a wonderful comment that maybe a theme for a next conference could be this, this issue of aesthetics and how it seems to mean something different to everyone. Um, so defining what they are and what they do, because that's something so central to architecture that no two architects seem to see, think alike on. Um, let's just want to point out. I, Trent, let's mull Excellent about. suggestion. Let's mull over this topic, uh, and you know, and we have to think about the framework, and we have to think about uh, funding, etc. Um, uh, but you know, uh, I'm certainly open to uh, the discussion. Uh, we will continue and think. Uh, take this week to um, review the, the options. Um, I think this format is wonderful. Uh, it's very. Uh, uh, lively debate and uh, it could go on and maybe the interval of one year uh, gives us enough time to um, fundamentally think and uh, substantively think um, about these issues. Uh, Sorry so for the question. Certainly for the week, for the next week, please come prepared with your ideas. And um, uh, we should uh, now leave our uh, Asian um, 
colleagues like uh, the colleagues from India and from uh, Singapore to get some rest for because uh, Monday is already around the corner. <laughs> and uh, thank you uh, for our um, American uh, colleagues. Uh, we in Europe uh, are pigs in the middle. Uh, we can enjoy an, an, uh, uh, an early evening. Thank you, everyone, and uh, see, you next, uh, see you next week. Okay. Thank you. See you then. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you a lot. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>